the uh, Prince William County School Board would like to call it to order. We have an approval for um, a closed session agenda. We have a motion, Ms. Um, Jesse. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session agenda as recommended. Do you have a second? second. Ms. Ralston seconds. Any discussion? Please vote. Uh, next, we have a motion. I need a motion to enter closed session. Motion's in order. Ms. Jesse? Uh, I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711, the Prince William County School Board in a closed session for the following reasons. One, to discuss and consider the assignment, appointment, performance, discipline, and resignation of specific employees, appointees, or officers of the Prince William County School Board under Virginia Code 2.2-3711A1 and 8. Two, to discuss to consult with division council and staff regarding specific personnel matters and threatened and pending litigation under Virginia Code 2.2-3711A1, 7, and 8, and 3, to discuss and consult with legal counsel for the school board regarding specific, sorry, specific legal matters involving the performance of specific personnel which require the provision of information and legal advice under Virginia Code 2.2-3711A1 and 8. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Ralston seconds. Um, any discussion? Please vote. Vote is six yes, two absent, motion passed. Okay, the Prince William County School Board will now enter um, closed session and return in about an hour. The Prince William County School Board will now enter, oh, I'm sorry, will now return to open session. Um, we do not have any closed session action items and we are gonna move on to the adoption of the closed session consent agenda. A motion's in order. Mr. Chairman, the clerk advises that she's not ready to start yet. It's been she's five minutes, 10 minutes. Yeah, I think that's do, do you need, how much longer do you need? Technical difficulties, we will return in five minutes. CS part of the event, which does not require us to, to vote on anything right now. So in the interest of time, um, because we do have a lot of citizens here to speak, we're going to uh, kick off our meeting with a Positively PWCS presentation like we do. Community partnerships help us enhance the quality of education we provide to our students. Superintendent Dr. Waltz will introduce tonight's presenters who will tell you more about the valuable Prince William County Schools Community Partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Latif and members of the board. I'm proud to share that PWCS and our students and staff benefit from the many community partnerships we have formed. Tonight's presentation will focus on our relationship with the County Parks and Recreation Department. Tracy Hannigan, Deputy Director, and Carolyn Custer, who is now the Parks and School Liaison, are here tonight to share more about this partnership. Good evening, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Waltz. Uh, I am delighted to be here this evening. And I have a 30-year history with the school system, and it's because I've been here a long time in this county, working and living. So I have an extensive experience um, of, of seeing behind the scenes of what all the great things that happen within the school system. And when I was told I have five minutes to talk, I found that difficult because it's not that I don't have a lot to say, I have too much to say. So I would be happy to come back at any time and help fill you in on my other years with you. Um, but I'm thrilled tonight to say that I believe we have solved your issue with classroom space and it's in our parks. So I saw the eyebrows go up. If I really had, it is in the parks. So I'd like to walk you through some of our current partnerships that we have with the school system. 
Because we have some new uh, board members, I'd like to remind everybody that we do have an existing school cooperative agreement. And this has been in place for over 20 years. And it was last adopted by the Board of Supervisors and the school board back in 2017. And this provides for shared use of our f respective facilities. For an example, our Parks and Recreation uh, Dynamic Grounds Maintenance staff, they maintain your elementary and middle school athletic fields. That would be our area of expertise of turf, is turf management. We also have the schools um, are utilized after your use on evenings and weekends um, for the high volume of uh, youth that participate in the um, sports leagues, and we had 35,000 participants last year. We also have uh, high schools utilize our, our amenities. We have uh, Forest Greens Golf Course and our Prince William Golf Course. We have, I believe, eight of your golf teams utilize these golf courses for their um, high school athletics, as well as at Lake Ridge Park Crew Facility. We have seven of your high schools rowing on the beautiful Occoquan Reservoir for their crew competitions. One of our new strategic initiatives is the hiring of Ms. Carolyn Custard. She retired from the school system last July, um, and we quickly recognized an opportunity. So this was very strategic for us in terms of um, grabbing one of your best. And Carolyn brings to us as this new uh, position for us as the part-time school, park and school liaison, her job is to work to collaborate and make things happen quickly in terms of expediting opportunities that we don't want to leave uh, behind. So Carolyn is excited to work closely with our Parks and Rec staff. And the exciting thing for me is Carolyn's been with uh, Parks and Rec now, I think, 11, 12 weeks. And she continues to say, I had no idea you all did this. So what that, to me, was like, we need to continue our awareness campaign to make sure everybody understands what the opportunities are um, between our parks <coughs> facilities and your school facilities. Carolyn has truly been a game changer for us. Next, I'd like to talk to you about our Science in the Park program. And this is a dynamic program that we've had in place for 10 years, but str uh, strategically, the last five years, we really have honed in on opportunities of working with the school system. So we worked with your science curriculum staff and we developed our Science in the Park program geared to hit on your Virginia SOLs regarding science. So I'm thrilled to say by the time the school year is over, 7,100 of your K through five students will have come out to one of our parks to experience this opportunity. Getting them out to uh, be exposed to what animals are, ecosystems, erosion, uh, life cycles, um, is a, a fun opportunity um, to come and watch. And I would welcome all of you to come to a park that's in your jurisdiction. We'd be happy to demonstrate uh, what science in the park looks like for you. Um, I'm thrilled to say that um, I don't believe anybody ever retires from the school system, by the way, uh, between Carolyn and, and Miss Ray Darlington. Uh, Ray Darlington called me uh, probably about six weeks ago after a other conversation and said, we need to talk about something. And she said, I want you to know what's going on at Potomac Middle School with the aquaponics program. And Mr. Ted Rosenack is here tonight. And we met quickly with him and the dynamic team at Potomac Middle School in their aquaponics lab that's being uh, constructed there, dynamic. And what we're going to do is partner in, in uh, integrating aquaponics into our science in the park K through five and working that in so that when they get to the middle school, they're already exposed to aquaponics. So this is just an example here of some photos. One of uh, the beautiful views that we have in our parks, you know they're beautiful, but one of my favorite views is when we see school buses rolling in. That is just a great opportunity and it warms my heart when I see them. So science in the park, we generally, depending on which large regional park we're at, it's six to 10 stations. The kids will spend several hours with us and they will rotate through these stations being exposed, hands-on, dirty, smelling the air and just learning. Um, that's one of our park rangers there uh, working with a group of kids in the animal cycle. A new initiative that uh, came to us last fall is the mental health initiative. And this was really a community initiative that came to the school system, to the park system. And it was led by 
the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, the Prince William chapter, and Dr. Alice Howard and her dynamic team, they secured a grant through the Potomac Health Foundation, and then they partnered with the school systems who partnered with us. So we had Grand Park Middle School and try, I'm sorry, Grand Park Middle School and Ripon Middle School come out to our Veterans Park and Locust Shade Park, and we took two of the six components of this grant in teaching them about mental health and how to help themselves. So we are a big believer of let's get off the screen and into the green. And this was a great example. The photo on the left was just joy. I was there that day watching. And to see the joy on their face of being outdoors. But then what we did was we walked them a little bit down the trail and we asked them to stop. And we asked them to listen. And we asked them, what did you hear? And they're like, I don't hear anything. We knew they were still up here and we focused on uh, relaxation and breathing techniques and closed their eyes. And it was amazing what they then were telling us what they heard. So our efforts there were to help them uh, prepare themselves for when they are stressed and how to handle that through uh, breathing techniques, closing their eyes and focusing. We then worked with them indoors in terms of our yoga and meditation fitness staff worked with them, teaching them how to do this for themselves, whether they're at a classroom preparing to take their SOLs and they have anxiety, how to center themselves, relax for better success on their test. Uh, yoga, this was an interesting and very fun opportunity to watch. I wasn't sure how it was going to go, um, but you all have some awesome yoga participants and they were into it. The other part of our uh, curriculum that we taught on mental health was the fitness and nutrition. That's one of our uh, highest areas of expertise between our Chin Center and Dale City Rec Center, our fitness areas. The, the program here was really designed um, to have them do more of the talking in terms of nutrition and fitness. We know that everybody goes to fast food, but it was helping them understand what they're putting into their body, what their sugar level does, but also how to help them make better decisions of that food selection. It was a great discussion. They were very engaged. The other photo is them working with our fitness staff doing push-ups and exercises. And the goal here was to help them understand that they don't have to be a member at a gymnasium to work on their fitness. It's walking. Uh, the county has spent significant effort and um, funds to make connectivity occur in this county with trail systems. And we want them to just focus on being outdoors. Walking doesn't have to always be running. One of the last initiatives that I want to share with you this evening is the historic preservation. This uh, historic preservation used to belong to the Public Works Department, and we moved them in under Parks, Recreation, Tourism about a year ago. Makes sense. Um, we are thrilled, again, that we have worked with uh, your history uh, professionals to roll in hands-on history programs, similar to Science in the Park, where the, when they are brought out to the history uh, historic sites, um, they will be tied into the SOLs of uh, history. So we believe that these, you know, Prince William County, as you know, is rich in history. So this is just one more opportunity to get kids outdoors, but we still are your classroom, your outdoor classroom that we want to continue to um, enhance um, getting kids outdoors. So in closing, I want to let you know that we consider our partnership to be very valuable with the school system. We don't take our responsibility lightly as parks and recreation professionals. We believe that we are one united team. And Dr. Waltz have talked and I have spoken about this in one team. We both have PwC at the beginning of our initials. And that's really where it should be. We are Prince William County. We are very passionate about what we do, whether it's a school system or parks and recreation and tourism. There are many opportunities still untapped, and we look forward to continuing to partner with all of you. And I, I am very passionate about what I do, and I can tell you in my experience with the school system that regardless of what level of uh, position I have interacted with, within your school system, whether it's a bus driver, a custodian, your AD, your bookkeeper, your superintendent, dynamic. You know, I look up and I see world class. It's a world class education. It's an experience. So on behalf of Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism, we thank you for your commitment to continuing to serve the citizens of Prince William County. If there was a baton in this race, 
right? A baton. You all have it varying times, whether it's from 7 to 2.05 or 8.45 to 3. We want to grab that baton when the school's out. That's our, that's our commitment. We're here for you to help keep these kids engaged in the right activities and fulfill what their passion is. I want to leave you with one last thing, which is a call to action. And I'm going to challenge Dr. Waltz tonight to say within the next 60 to 90 days, have a staff meeting in a park. I think I just heard your staff cheer. It's an, it changes your perspective. I would challenge all of you as well. Please come out to the parks. See what's happening with the kids who are visiting. We know that nature is our great restorer. We know that we don't have enough time. We need more of it. This picture here was taken at the Neapsco Creek <laughs> off of Blackburn Road in last month. But what I want to show you is I want to show you our newest classroom, which is the Neapsco Creek Boardwalk. It opened last June. It's a three-quarter mile boardwalk that was constructed strategically with teaching platforms. So you will see this beautiful photo. And I has anybody by chance visited it yet? Well, yes. Thank you very much. You will want to go there after you see this video. So thank you again for your time tonight, and um, enjoy the video. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. <laughs> Ms. Zargapur? Um, so I have worked for the Parks and Rec and Tourism Department before. Uh, I want to also just commend that whole um, section of our government because 
uh, as an employee over there, we were tasked with coming up with ideas of classes for kids and things like that. And so it was, it's really nice to work for a, a, um, a government body that wanted the employee's input as well. So some of those things that you saw, the yoga with the kids and things like that, um, that came out of the fitness departments I worked in. And uh, they also have um, adaptive programs and, and programs for special needs kids specifically. So I encourage people to look at those because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing what uh, Parks and Rec and uh, tourism is doing these days. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Thank you. I also want to um, follow Ms. Agapur's uh, comments and commend Parks and Recs. And um, as a resident who lives walking distance from the Neasco Creek Boardwalk um, and sees the, the issues in my district, I'd also like to um, put a plug to encourage you to develop more programs, um, especially when it comes to classes, because a lot of times what Parks and Recs offers is the only affordable sports and activities in the area. And I'm sure you're aware they fill up within a minute or two as of being announced. So I'm happy to um, encourage you to, to the Board of County Supervisors as well, because your, pro your programs are such high quality, um, but we could always use more of them. Ms. Jesse. Uh, I just want to congratulate uh, Dr. Howard and 100 Black Coalition, 100 Black Women. They are everywhere. And I know, Ms. Custard, you were very active with that group, and I saw Ms. Chen also retired. Uh, they have opened a credit union or a bank at Jenkins uh, Elementary. And I just want to say thank you for all the work that you do in this community. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. So I think we'll try to get back on track here, and we will... Um Oh, and I'd like the school board members to hit F5 to refresh for the updated um, computers. And we're going to move to um, adopting the closed session consent agenda. Motions in order. The approval of the closed session agenda. Ms. Williams. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I move the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session consent agenda as recommended. Do we have a second? Mr. Chairman, I second. Ms. Ralston seconds. Any discussion? Please vote. <coughs> vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Move on to the closed session certification of motions in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3712, the closed session of the Prince William County School Board meeting of March 4th, 2020, be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, it be it resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed session meeting were heard and discussed or considered by the school board. A second. I second. Ms. Ralston seconds. Any discussion? Please vote. Vote is eight, yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Next we'll have the, um, oh, so I guess I can. I would like to call this meeting the Prince William County School Board to order. There will be a moment of silence at, uh, at my request um, first. Okay, thank you. Next we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, the flag is over here. Ms. Hamidi, if you can lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to the approval of the public meeting agenda. A motion's in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting agenda as recommended. Do you have a second? 
Ms. Ralston seconds. Any discussion? As seeing no discussion, please vote. Vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. Next, we'll move on to the adoption of the consent agenda, motions in order. Ms. Williams. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting consent agenda as recommended. No, you're on uh, 1401. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let's go there. Oh, do it. oh got it. Do I have a second? Sorry. <laughs> Ms. Ralston seconds. Any discussion? <coughs> Ms. Williams. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to um, highlight 1406. I'm glad that the school division has taken the opportunity to uh, recognize Equity in Education Month. Excellent. Any further discussion? Mrs. Jackson. Um, is, would this be a good time to discuss um, my appointment for the equity? Sure. Okay. <laughs> what number is that? 14 what? That's 14.02. Um, sure. Okay. I'm excited to appoint Ms. Carpenter for um, this position. Um, because of her passion for equity, her experience in education, including um, in administration, and also being a parent of a Prince William County student. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Any further comments? Okay, please vote. Vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. Wonderful, next we are on to our um, Student representative who will speak tonight, Ms. Tahira Hamidi, who is a senior at Freedom High School and our student member. Take it away, Ms. Hamidi. Good evening, board members, Chairman, Dr. Watts. Um, um, I'd like to start by talking about the Senate meeting. We recently had one on February 21st here at KLC. Um, we discussed mostly things based on committees, which I mentioned last meeting, um, and our unity committee, which focuses on having cross-county events. Um, we are almost finished planning the all-for-one ball. We are just looking for different methods of funding the event. And we also are planning to have a music festival for um, all high schools in the county. Um, we are looking for a venue right now, and preferably we'd like it to be for one of the schools in the county. Um, moving on to the mental health committee. Um, we are very, all of us are very excited to see that mental health days got passed as an excused absence. Um, we also today had a uh, mental health absence focus group meeting, which I unfortunately was not able to attend, so um, Ben, the other student rep, will be able to fill you guys in on that. Um, and we also, I also did come across reading something where teachers are, for the district, are going to start being put in training to be able to address and notice um, any mental health issues and things like that. Um, Moving on to education, um, a lot of our senators have started to reach out to both middle school and elementary schools, um, informing them about specialty programs, opportunities they have, anything like that. Um, we've also had a lot of Senate member members starting to set, sit in with the PTSO meetings, parent-teacher organization, um, and just put in their input, input, see what they can do more, and see what needs to be brought up. Um, last, The last committee we have for this year is equity. Um, Senate members have been talking to the principals about the budget, where it goes, what can be done, what is feasible, and what is already planned. Um, while I'm talking about the Senate, I'd like to again bring up the Teacher Senate. The idea originated when Ben and I attended uh, the PWEA legislative reception in January. There we were able to have a conversation with the president, Miss Riley O. Casey, and she brought up that um, a long time ago, Prince William did in fact have a teacher senate. And from there, we kind of took the idea and wanted to see if there was a way to bring it back. Um, this is very beneficial for teachers and students. It helps bridge the gap between communication and stuff, and it lets teachers have a say in what happens in their classrooms. I have also been speaking and working with Mr. Jeff Gervin um, about the process. He was the one who, he was one of the people who brought up involving a student senate along with the student reps, and I'm kind of going to be piggybacking off of what he did to incorporate a uh, teacher senate. Um, I'd also really like to have the opportunity to meet with any board members, um, Dr. Latif, Dr. Waltz, any of Dr. Waltz's staff members to be able to sit down and talk to see what route we should take to be able to establish something like this. Um, we are also working on getting time on the agenda at department chair meetings to be able to discuss this more closely with um, teachers already in leadership positions to see what they have to say about it. 
Um, as I did mention before, I am working on establishing something known as a lunch sharing service. Um, this will help students who unfortunately are not able to provide for themselves or did not get an opportunity to have lunch for the day. Currently, I am writing a proposal for my school to have it passed and from then on, I'll, I'll spread it out to other schools. Um, there, it is important to say that there currently are other schools already participating in um, a program such as this one. Um, I am still working closely with Mr. Adam Russo to see what can be done about passing something like this. Um, as I mentioned before, the main focus this year for my position is student decriminalization. Um, it is still a work in progress. Um, I do have a meeting scheduled for Friday with Ms. Dara Duggar. She is the director of OzMap. Um, I am working on getting more information, and once I have a solid foundation, I will put a presentation together for you guys to see. Um, of course, no uh, student sent speaker time would be complete without focusing on the positive things. Um, starting with Stonewall Jackson High School, they uh, started a mentoring program with Ellis Elementary School for any troubled fifth graders. Um, seniors get to work together with them, be a mentor or a figure in the life that they can follow. The program currently is only focused towards male students, but they are working on um, expanding it towards females as well. Um, Freedom High School. Um, recently celebrated Black History Month, we were able to put on a show, um, and uh, at the track event, Freedom won first in the relay race. Woodbridge High School hosted a leadership summit which taught 18-year-olds um, what their new freedoms were and how not to get caught up or in trouble by them. Um, Brentsville had its first black student union meeting. Um, the union is open to all minorities. And Woodbridge had its first teacher-student volleyball game. Potomac ha hosted a heritage night. Um, they got Esau parents involved. Um, students made call to Spanish-speaking families to invite them and let them know what was going on. And the goal for this meeting was to translate the PTSO meeting and help um, English as second, second language students um, understand Potomac and get a better feel for the school. Um, Osborne Park C uh, SEA is putting together homeless care packages and they're organizing a leadership conference currently. And lastly, Hilton will have World Language Day tomorrow. Um, the last thing I would like to mention today, uh, mostly aimed towards students, especially current sophomores and juniors. Um, student rep applications for next year have been put out. They are due March 13th. Please sit down, think about applying. It's an amazing opportunity. You get to meet tons of new people, go through tons of new experiences. Um, and it looks great on any application, whether you're applying for a job, college, scholarships, anything. Overall, it's an amazing opportunity and I would recommend it for anybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hamidi. Appreciate that. Next, we'll move on to citizens comment time. Um, Everyone, so today we're, we're gonna be listening to everyone. We have 21 people signed up to speak and um, you'll have three minutes to speak and the clerk will keep the time. The lights on the monitor will indicate your progress. The yellow light will signify that you should sum up your position. Red indicates your time is up and you should stop. Please use proper decorum manners while at the podium. If you do not do so, you'll be asked to step aside. Please give your name and address for the record when you approach the podium. And I will go ahead and call the first 10 speakers up and they can grab a, a seat up front if they choose. You don't have to. Michelle Nikolai, Richard Cra Craig, Emmett Fletcher, Swanell Wiggins, Wendy DiPietro, Anthony Bahizi, Landon Young, Delton Nichols, Tiziana Botino, and Cozy Bailey. Miss Michelle Nikolai. Michelle Nikolai, okay. Richard Craig. Good evening. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Richard Cray. I'm at 12003 Point Long Street Way, Woodbridge, Virginia, 22192. I was hoping to be number two so I could see, you know, get a breath, but we'll just jump into it. Um, I'm coming today to talk about the good news of Woodbridge uh, Senior High School. It seems like in the past few months anyways, there's been a lot of negativity brought, uh, a lot of changes, and with change sometimes comes misunderstanding and, and misinformation. So. A little bit about myself, I'm a um, retired HR professional, 29 years in the Army, uh, Prince William County small business owner with HR experience, um, the VB VABC president, um, the JV head coach for girls lacrosse and assistant varsity uh, girls lacrosse coach. So 
Um, been involved with the school in the booster program for six years. Um, different administrators, uh, both principal and uh, athletic directors. Um, and with the last, uh, with the new athletic director, uh, Jason Eldridge, I'll tell you that we have never been more supportive, supportive, supported rather, in the programs that we support. Um, it's the first time that we've had uh, collective decision making, collaborative decision making of all the programs, the 20 plus programs we have on everything we decide, it's a vote from the programs. Um, we've tried it in the past to get accountability for programs uh, spending uh, and it's been, it's been troublesome to get the, the administration and the uh, activities director to, to get together and I call uh, Principal Abney and, and uh, Mr. Eldridge, you know, the dynamic duo, they team up and they, they've held us accountable, the coaches accountable, the students, the parents, uh, and the coaches. Um, but with that being said, um, I just wanted to go over a little bit of the success of uh, Woodbridge programs. And I apologize, I had like six different uh, things uh, written out, so hopefully I don't run out of time. Um, but just in the last two seasons alone, um, that's just fall and winter, right? So we had one district champion in the fall, one district runner-up, five regional champs. Uh, 21 district selections, one district player of the year, nine all-regional players, one district champion for the winner, two district runner-ups, one region champion, four region qualifiers, one top three state fi finisher, and then individual accomplishment, 63 top eight district finishers. That's in tra track, wrestling, and swimming. 26 all-district athletes, 12 district champions, nine district runner-ups, uh, 21 all-regional athletes, six regional champs, uh, three regional runner-ups, 19 state qualifiers, five all-state athletes, two state runner-ups, and one state champion. So that's just in two seasons, and that's because of the support that the athletes, the coaches, and um, just the community all together uh, get. I, well, I guess my time's up, but just please don't take the negativity. You know, there's a lot of positive things going on at Woodbridge, and it starts from the administrators. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Emmett Fletcher. Mr. Chairman, school board members, Dr. Waltz. The Woodbridge High School football, football crisis has taken too long to resolve. Board members, uh, put yourself in in the place of some of the parents that go that um, have kids going to Woodbridge. And I know we just got a glorifying report, but that's not what's really going on in the situ situation with a lot of the kids. And it's not all together. When he said all together, it's not all together. Um, we still have unhappy parents and children and football coaches and kids. It's not a whole, it's polarized and don't set up there and be convinced that it's not polarized because it is. We say we want a world-class education, but we want a world-class educa education for all the students, whether they're on the western end of the county or eastern end. I think if you had a child, as some of the parents here have come up and said, some of the deals and, and conversations that they have had, I think you'd be quite perturbed to witness what has happened. Uh, the coach, I, I think Coach G is a great football coach. He's produced, he helps the kids. Um, the hull feed situation was another situation that, that some personnel, someone dropped the ball on that. Again, we say Eastern and West, okay? We had a, a similar situation at Colgan High School. It was in the paper for a couple times, and they received due process, justice supposed to be blind and fair, well balanced. But then we got the situation over at Woodbridge that has dragged on since August. Since August, in every school board meeting, all the citizens, the school board members, we get up and quote the Pledge of Allegiance. Live your creed. I mean, we all say the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America, to the flag, but yet when it comes to an investigation, 
or to vote on something, we go back to separate but unequal. And that's what we're looking at. We want justice, we want it now, and we want, it, we want due process. We're gonna continue to come back until this is resolved. I don't care, you could have anyone come from Woodbridge High School to speak, but there are, there are issues on both sides. And we know what the parents say, we know what the children say, we know what the football coach said. We got to do the right thing. Live your creed. You say it, pledge Thank allegiance you, to Fletcher. the flag, so live by it. Swanell Wiggins. I am Swanell Wiggins, and my address is on file. As I was pondering about what I would speak about t this evening, I, was, I remembered an incident that happened to me when I was in first grade. My class was at recess and a group of my Caucasian friends were playing in the jungle gym. And I went over and asked what they were playing. And they said, pajama party. And I excitedly went over and said, well, can I play too? And one of the girls answered and said, no. When I asked why, she said, because you're black. This incident happened in 1977. What has changed? If we fast forward to 2020, our children are faced with a director of student activities at Woodbridge Senior High School telling a group of minority students to return to where you came from and I'll be happy to sign those papers. What has changed? The same DSA at Woodbridge Senior High School told a student leader of Bolivian descent who thought the DSA was made a comment about her country, we're in America. I don't know where you think you're at, but we're in America. What has changed? Nothing. Racially undertone comments hurt children, whether it's 1977 or 2020. Parents advocated then and are doing so now. Only, the only difference is that in 1977, the parents were not ignored. The same DSA at Woodbridge Senior High School disregarded a federal law and violated the privacy of a minority student. What has changed? Now there are allegations that the DSA at Woodbridge Senior High School is violating Title IX, which protects female students. What has changed? More recently, he, he, is allegedly, he allegedly is about to engage in improper and unethical hiring practices. Do you know what a back door is? What has changed? By not doing anything about the cancer that is growing inside Woodbridge Senior High School, it seems that the DSA has developed a sense of privilege. It is like he is untouchable and can say and do anything he wants because he realizes he has friends at the central office that will protect him. You will, we will not be ignored and you will not ignore us any longer. You should do what you advise the board, advise everyone to do at the beginning of this saga. Remove Jason Eldridge as director of student activities at Woodbridge Senior High School. The Bible reminds us that the race is not given to the swift nor to the strong, but he who endures till the end. Thank you. Wendy DiPietro. My name is Wendy DiPietro. I live at 13546 Litz Away. Um, I am not only an employee of Woodbridge Senior High School, but I've also had two children graduate from Woodbridge Senior High School. Woodbridge is an amazing school with dedicated teachers, assistant teachers, secretaries, custodians, and administrators. We have been named a school of excellence for the second year in a row. Our school continues to excel in academics, the fine arts, robotics, as well as athletics. The athletics department under the leadership of Jason Eldridge has made huge strides in making the fields and limited indoor space fair and equitable for all schools, as well as assist many of the sports teams to purchase much needed uniforms and equipment. Our fall and winter sports teams reach district, region, and state playoffs. 
Our, Cardinal, our, dist, our wrestling team won the Cardinal District and Region 6B championships. We had eight wrestlers go to states, all placing in the top six with one winning a state championship as a sophomore. Two sophomore girls went to states in indoor, indoor track. One was an all-state finisher. Woodbridge continues to work towards involving students of all race, ethnic backgrounds, as well as gender. We will continue to build bridges, close gaps, and leave legacy. This is us. Thank you very much. Anthony Bahizi. Hi, my name is Anthony Bahizi and my address is on file. I am a sophomore at Patriot High School and I'd like to thank the school board leaders for your commitment to make schools net zero and adopting the net zero mindset. But there's one other thing that's causing problems for our earth and that is the overuse of fossil fuels. As a child, I was watching this, the news with my older brother and sister while drawing and my jaw dropped Oh, and my hometown in Florida had been destroyed by Hurricane Irma, and I felt the tears form in my eyes as my birthplace was almost destroyed. Years late, oh, completely destroyed. Years later, I discovered that uh, the more hurricanes are being formed, and not even just hurricanes. Tornadoes and other disasters are forming at an alarming rate, and there might be even more in the future that will probably be even worse, and the culprit is the over use of fossil fuels, which is being burned and made into greenhouse gases and slowly destroying the atmosphere, creating more disasters and therefore more lives to be lost. The amount of fossil fuels your schools produce must be banned or even reduced so we can be able to save our world for us and more generations to come. It may not be enough, but at least the children of the future will know that their ancestors tried. Thank you. Landon Young. Hello, my name is Landon Young and I'm a student at Battlefield High School. My address, I think, is on file. I'd like to thank the members of the board for allowing me and those I'm with to speak today. Additionally, I'd like to thank those of you who in recent weeks have taken time out of your busy schedules to discuss our concerns. As I'm hoping you know and understand, climate change is real. Not only is this a preeminent issue of your lifetime, but more so of mine and of ours. This is a crisis. As the governments of the world struggle to tackle what is truly an inconvenient truth, much is being lost in the time it takes to argue about notions of what we can't do, and not enough time is being devoted to realities of what we can do. Um, we, we must act at a local level. One way to act is to implement net zero schools. A net zero school is a school that is completely carbon neutral or even carbon negative. A uh, net zero school would offset nine, 920 tons of CO2 per year. Imagine what PWCS could do for the community it serves and the world at large if we were to follow in the footsteps of many other countries and municipalities across the nation who have set this as a goal. In addition, I'm sure you're well aware that schools are expensive to run. K-12 schools across the country spend $8 billion on energy alone. However, there is another way. At Discovery Elementary, a net zero school in Arlington, Virginia, they save $117,000 a year just by being net zero. If PWCS were to implement something similar, around $10 million could be put back into us, the students. Not to mention the gift of clean water, clean air, and clean soil. In fact, if you would like to see this for yourself, we are willing and ready to organize a tour of Discovery Elementary for any members of the board interested. Virginia Beach Public Schools is another fantastic example of, schools, of how schools can be at the forefront of environmental change. At Battlefield, our environmental club has made it our goal to obtain green schools certification from the National Wildlife Federation. Every Thursday, we go around and collect our school's recycling. We are starting a compost program and clean up the streams on our property as much as we can. At Patriot, do they, they, at Patriot, they do the same, and across the county, they do the same. The students of PWCS are doing our part. We ask you to join us. After all, you cannot provide a world-class education if there's barely a world left. Thank you. Uh, we also have cards, like Valentine's Day cards. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, yeah, pass them out. It'd be great. Next, while you're uh, doing that, we'll call up Delton Nichols.
Good evening to Chair Latif, Superintendent Waltz, school board. Thank you for seeing me this evening. I'm Delton Nichols. I live at 12251 Charles Lacey Drive, Manassas, Virginia. I live in the county. Um, I'm here to speak to you against a bill in the 14 High School off the Prince William County Parkway between Holtley and Color River Roads. I am the Homeowner Association President of the Hunters Ridge Community. There are 216 homes in our community. Our community is next to Bryn Forest, Hunters Ridge Reserve, and Barrington Oaks Community. Added together, there are about 1,000 homes. Members of my community came to the June 19, 2019 school board meeting, about 73 of us, and expressed our vehement opposition to building the school at this location. I represent my community tonight, and we are as vehemently against building the high school at this location now as we were nine months ago. We have already pointed out uh, to the previous school board sound reasons why you should not build at this location, such as it will create unbearable traffic congestion on the Prince William County Parkway, it will destroy the streams that run through the environmentally sensitive Delaney property, which feeds the Chesapeake watershed. The surrounding communities are all on, as well as our community, on well and septic, and some residents already experience an inadequate water supply from their wells. Perhaps one of the most compelling reasons is that according to your own published strategic plan, there's no real growth in Mid-County. Rather, the growth is in the Eastern Quarter, and your original solution to address student population growth in the Eastern Quarter is to build the 14th High School in Mid-County, which leaves many of us, a coalition of us, puzzled because the school division constructed Patriot High School, the 11th High School, in the Western Quarter in 2011, and you constructed Colgan High School, the 12th high school in Mid-County in 2016 with this Olympic-sized swimming pool and the $125,000 Steinway Grand Concert Piano. You are constructing the 13th high school in the Western Quarter near Jiffy Loop Live, and you want to construct the 14th high school in Mid-County to address student growing population in Eastern Quarter. Don't you believe that the diverse Eastern Quarter communities deserve a high school investment near their communities, similar to the school investment that you have provided in Mid-County in the Western Quarter? Build the 14 high school where it is needed in the Eastern Quarter, not in Mid-County, and demonstrate that you are not engaged in the practice of investing more in Mid-County in the Western Quarter than you are in the Eastern Quarter, and avoid the appearance of Thank inequity you. and Thank discrimination. You, Thank you. Thank you. Tiziana Botino. Hi, good evening. My name is Tiziana Botino. My address is on file. Um, and I just here to want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, first of all, I'm in so I want to speak in solidarity with the previous speakers with the Woodbridge team, uh, the B B Woodbridge High School that have been coming here. So I just want to um, you know, be here in solidarity. Um, but I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for hearing us out about net zero schools uh, and speaking up in support during the last budget meeting that we attended. Um, I would like to especially uh, thank Ms. Jackson and Ms. Wall for their questions and for uh, letting us know that we were heard. And uh, thank you, Dr. Latif, for directing staff to look into making every future and existing school net zero. I believe it is the very first time in Prince William County school history that such a strong focus has been put on sustainability, and we are confident it will pay off. Uh, first, financially, and by giving students unique educational opportunities unlike any other county has. That will be the very best way to show that we truly have world-class education in our county. Uh, we would love to hear all the other board members to be, become vocal supporters of our efforts as well. Uh, we also like to ask you to include net zero language in your strategic plan as uh, Dr. Latif proposed and uh, the CIP as well to consolidate your commitment and to put out a request for information for net zero schools which is an underutilized and free of cost means to study this, ex this exciting opportunity. 
We understand the need for more resources and we commit to also work with the Board of County Supervisors to ask that they sufficiently fund your budget. This is, uh, that is where we want to do that, but if that is if you keep your word and commitment to greener schools and we commit to show up and ask for them to support you. So thank you so much for hearing us out. Thank you. Cozy Bailey. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cozy Bailey. My address is on file, and I am the president of the Prince William NAACP. I'd like to start this evening by asking you a question somewhat rhetorical. What do you call it when an institution engages in systemic and strategic influence, which may be legal, but it undermines the institution's effectiveness by weakening the public's trust in that institution? The answer is, you call it ins institutional corruption. Institutional corruption occurs when an institution charters a so-called investigation to be conducted by a so-called outside agency, and the so-called outside agency, in fact, has been on the institution's payroll for a decade. Not to mention that the institution's in-house counsel is a former partner of the so-called outside agency. When that happens, the public's trust is weakened. That's what you did, Dr. Waltz. This sham of an investigation has incredibly weakened the public's trust in the Prince William County School Division. And that's actually an incredible feat considering how low you were on our trust meter before you charted this action. I imagine right now, your trusted associate superintendent for high school is dying to send you a text saying, don't worry, it's only the black folks who don't trust you. But don't be fooled. You and he have obviously missed the fact that most of the people in this county, the people whose children you were paid to serve are people of color. Whether you like it or not, change has come to Prince William County. What do you call it, next question, when an institution engages in patterns and structures that impose oppressive or otherwise negative conditions on identifiable groups on the basis of race or ethnicity? You call that institutional racism. You see, institutional racism occurs when the unparalleled success of an award-winning African-American coach is called into question, and then it's investigated. And then when no evidence of cheating is discovered, because no cheating occurred, he's subjected to an intensely hostile work environment until he resigns in order to maintain his sanity, his dignity, his reputation, and to remove his family from the chaos that was following. <laughs> Dr. Waltz, this situation has caused me to dig deeply into past practices to verify the stories that I've begun to hear about your regime. Now here's what my investigation has determined. You are presiding over an institution that is corrupt and racist. Your hiring standards are corrupt and racist. And your handling of this horrible institution, excuse me, situation at Woodbridge Senior High School is corrupt and racist. Are you be, and you're being enabled by a group of sycophants with titles like deputy and associate, by a legal counsel who cares not about the children, but only about winning, and indirectly by a crippled school board hamstrung by a code of ethics that must have been drafted by someone longing for the good old days, the days of oppression, repression, and dispossession. But let me tell you, like a tree Thank planted you, by the Bailey. waters, we shall Thank not you, be Bailey. moved. Please remove. Thank you. Mr. Eldridge. Richard Stark. Good evening. <clears throat> Richard Stark and uh, my address is uh, on file. This evening I'd like to uh, share a story with you. Imagine one morning I wake up and I feel a little ill. I go and see my family physician, physician uh, <clears throat> Dr. Waltz, MD, and he examines me. I must just clarify that all names in the story are fictitious, by the way. Dr. Waltz checks me out, and he says that I'm actually sick. I need to do some blood work, and I need to get checked out, come back tomorrow. I come back the next day, he says, I am, I'm really, really sick, I am terminally ill. I need to get into hospital today, I need surgery, I need medication, and I need to change my lifestyle. I need to exercise more. I need to stop smoking. I need to quit drinking alcohol. And I need to live a healthy lifestyle. I say to Dr. Wells, this is crazy. This is madness. I can't change my life like that. I need a second opinion. 
I go and see Dr. Hamidi. Dr. Hamidi is a brilliant doctor, graduated medical school at the age of 21. She examines me and comes to the same conclusion. I am very, very ill. I cannot change my life. This is too drastic. I go and see a third doctor. I go and see Dr. Jackson. She checks me out, examines me, and guess what? Same thing. Fourth doctor, same thing. Fifth doctor, same thing. I see 33 different doctors, and they all tell me the same thing. Finally, I go and see a 34th doctor. He examines me, he checks my blood, and he says, Richard, it's not conclusive. We don't really know if you're sick. We can't really tell if you're sick. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Come back in a year or two's time, and we'll check you out again. What should I do in this situation? What would you all do in this situation? I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go and get surgery. I'm gonna go take the medicine. I'm gonna get better. I'm gonna change my lifestyle. Stop drinking, stop smoking, get exercise. Ladies and gentlemen, 33 out of 34 climate scientists agree that our earth is changing. Climate change is changing the earth that we live on. The time is now for us to make those drastic changes. No more fossil fuels. Electric school buses, solar panels on the roof of our schools. We need this change now. It's not drastic, and all the doctors in the world are calling for it. Thank you for your service. I am hurt that Dr. Latif wasn't on that list. Well, I think the results would have been different. Caroline Petty Kane. Hi, my name is Caroline Petty Kane, and my address is on file. Um, I'm a junior at Battlefield High School, and thank you for allowing me to speak and giving you your time to hear about fossil free and net zero schools. I am certain you are aware of the current climate crisis and the reports from the International Planet of Climate Change with alarming facts about our future. These horrifying predictions and the apparent lack of government action is the reason I'm here and why all of these t other teenagers are here instead of doing our homework or even just relaxing with our families at home like teenagers are supposed to. Now it may seem drastic to preach for a cause that we can't feel the effects of yet, but we certainly will soon. In almost every conversation I personally have had about switching to a sustainable future, the first thing anyone has mentioned is cost. If we ignore the fact that K through 12 school districts already spend $8 billion on energy, we can at least understand that everything else you could possibly spend the money on becomes completely irrelevant if we ruin our planet. We also can't pay to get rid of the fear my peers and I share about our future. You're funding educations that might not matter at all. Think of my future and your children's futures as you make your decision and please invest in new school plans by 2020, new blueprints by 2021, and retrofit existing schools to be net zero and ensure that energy and sustainability should be included in the current capital improvement plan. Open the doors to sustainability and creativity will surely follow. Political change begins at the local level and the power is in your hands. If, please show you care about the students that trust you and the parents that elected you, thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Michelle Bauer. Good evening, school board members, Dr. Latif and Dr. Waltz. Hello, my name is Michelle Bauer and my address is on file. Once a Viking, always a Viking. I'm a 1989 graduate from Woodbridge High School. My oldest daughter graduated in 2012 from Woodbridge and my second child will graduate this June from Woodbridge. For the past four years, we've been heavily involved with cheer. We have also attended and followed our football and basketball teams throughout these past four years. Being involved in Woodbridge sports is an understatement. I've been watching the past few meetings and I've heard the concerns over Woodbridge Senior High School and Mr. Eldridge. I wanted to give a different perspective because all I have heard is the negative. I've been a fixture in the VABC Viking Athletic Booster Club for the past four years before Mr. Eldridge came to Woodbridge. The attendance at these meetings were maybe six people, not including the board members. The only time we had more members was when different sports were asking for money. When Mr. Eldridge came to the VABC, he came with ideas and changes that he has seen work in the past. 
These were radical changes to the way we have been running things, but after listening to the suggestions and the way that he has seen other booster clubs run, it all made perfect sense and included not just a couple of sports, but all sports. He brought a different insight into how the VABC could make money to help fund the sports and ideas which we have never thought of or heard of in the past. Since Mr. Eldridge has arrived, the VABC has grown significantly. We now have somewhere between 20 and 30 people that attend regularly. This is a mix of both coaches and parents. The VABC has recently purchased two ScoreVision scoreboards for the gymnasium. These are big, beautiful LED screens which allow for videos, pictures, and advertising, all of which can be used to make money to fund the sports pro programs at Woodbridge Senior High School. Without Mr. Eldridge and his insight, this would not have been possible. My husband and I thought this would be it once our senior graduated high school, and then we wouldn't have to worry about being an athletic parent any longer. All that has changed since Jason Eldridge has come in as the director of student activities. We have gotten to know Mr. Eldridge and see his vision for moving the school athletics forward. I see the same thing with the coaches and parents that attend the meetings. They too are buying into the system which can only help Woodbridge Athletics. His main focus is to make sure all programs have the equipment, uniforms, and funding they need. My husband and I have made it clear that we want to continue to help the Woodbridge Athletic community even though we will not have a child attending this fall. This is a direct reflection upon the respect that we have for the work and vision that Jason Eldridge has, so has shown for Woodbridge as a whole. As a sports parent, we all would like to see fairness across the board. That is what Mr. Eldridge is doing. I leave you with one question. Why are we talking about a coach who resigned, about a, reinstating a coach who resigned three times? Dr. Samia Harris. Good evening, my name is Samia Harris and my address is on file. Um, hello, <laughs> Dr. Latif, Dr. Watts, board members. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me be here. Um, today I'm uh, here to share with you uh, my thoughts. First, congratulations on your appointments, all of you. Uh, second, I'm really delighted that Virginia is paying attention to early childhood education, and there's a focus on it this year. And I'm here to share with you um, my hope and my vision on um, how we can help the community. Um, there are many accredited private schools and preschools in Prince William County who are accredited and licensed, and uh, we have the know-how, we have the experience, we have the space, we have the teachers, we have uh, the system in place and that will qualify us to be uh, partners uh, with you and uh, with uh, the state of Virginia. Um, I'm hoping that it will be real partnership, serious partnership. I'm asking that we would uh, have a role in it right from the beginning, right from the planning process. I have been trying to get information about how it will work. Up till now, I haven't been able to, neither from here, uh, nor from uh, the state, uh, from Virginia and the, the Department of Education. So I am hoping that it would not be rushed through uh, without the private sector's um, part in it. There's so much experience uh, that shouldn't be ignored. Uh, there are many other programs that can be expanded on that will serve the early childhood uh, education uh, children and families in the community. Uh, Prince William uh, Department of Social Services has programs that subsidize is the low income. It's already in place and contracts are uh, set already with uh, the county uh, uh, programs that are licensed and accredited. This can be expanded on if it's just a matter of giving the children the opportunity uh, to go to good schools. There's also Head Start, which I came to the county before your time, uh, Dr. Watts, many of times to say that there are many children on a waiting list and that the private school can play a part in that. I hope that you include us. I hope you don't ignore the experience in the community and I hope we can work together. Thank you so very much. Mahdia Najam. Or Najim.
Good evening. My name is Mania Najem, and I'm a senior at Patriot High School. My address is on file. This is currently my second time I stand before you to bring attention to the importance of Prince William County adopting policy and updating infrastructure to support net zero schools. I'd like to first offer my sincere thank you to the school board for directing staff to consider and develop a plan to update designs for new and existing schools. I look forward to the positive progressions within the county soon. We as students will continue to make as significant of an impact as possible, but we need all the support we can get. With the school board and county support, I know that we will be able to make a lasting difference in our Northern Virginia community. The money saved from decreased cost and energy can be allocated to find more staff, improve existing schools, or invest in research for future sustainable development. Although the switch might be logistically complex in the beginning, switching to net zero schools will increase the value of Prince William County, which provides an eco economic benefit to our locality. As a senior, I want to make sure the school system that has fostered my intellectual growth since kindergarten continues to improve and increase in value, even after I've gone on to university. And it's apparent that the school board is willing to support net zero schools, and I'm cognizant of the limits of this body. In order to make an effective change, we need the cooperation of everybody, everybody in this county, the energy team included, and not just a goal of net zero. We need action and we need it now. We shouldn't continue making a mistake just because we spent a long time making them, and I think that we should reconsider this, the designs for the new schools, even though it's not recommended. But yes, uh, thank you for your time, and I'm looking forward to your visit to Patriot, Ms. Jackson. Yeah. Richard Jesse. Good evening, Dr. Watts and Dr. Uh, Latif, members of the board. My name is Richard Jesse. My address is on file. I'd just like to say that, you know, I started, uh, I worked in human resources also, as the other gentleman said, for about 30 years. My field was in equal employment opportunity. And uh, with one company for 14 years, I did investigations and arbitration between employees and managers. It is one thing, and I appreciate the people coming tonight, and, when, you know, that's a right, and we want them here. But I also like to say that just because a person does the one thing good doesn't mean they didn't do something bad. And our complaint is not what he is doing now, it's what he did in the past. What he violated federal law, and the treatment that he said, that's our complaint. He could be a very good person in some aspect. As an example, Bill Cosby was a well-loved and everybody loved Bill Cosby, including myself for years. But then we found out some of the things that he did. Harvey Weinstein is another example. Did a lot of good things, did a lot of bad things. The current person who just dropped out of the presidential race was, you know, the mayor from New York. Did a lot of good things, but did a lot of things that were unapproved. He has, a, and as a Democrat, I appreciate all the help that he did. And I appreciate what he did today and stuff. But, you know, he still has to be held accountable. And what we're saying as citizens that we want this person to be held accountable for what he did, not what he is doing. Thank you. Chuck Ronco. Good evening again. Chuck Ronco, my address is on file. Uh, good evening. Dr. Latif, Dr. Waltz, members of the board, I'll be brief. First, I wanna say thank you all. Um, you all have been doing an enormous amount of work about maintaining or trying to improve the equity situation and looking at this budget with the lens of trying to help our most economically disadvantaged students. And I would just like to say that um, as we come near the end of the budget cycle, thankfully, um, that we take a look again at our subs and TAs because we need to be making sure that we take care of our most economically disadvantaged faculty and staff. 
Thank you very much. Jennifer Rokoski. Hi, good evening, Chairman Latif, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. My name is Jennifer Rakoski, and my address is on file with the clerk. I serve on the PWA Board of Directors, and we are grateful for the second year in a row, of, and the superintendent's proposal includes the Stephen Cola, along with no health incre um, insurance premiums. Um, Sorry, no increase in health insurance premiums, sorry. However, as you are aware, PWCS salaries continue to lag behind other Northern Virginia school divisions as evidenced by the FY 2020 WABY report. Recently, the PWA Board of Directors surveyed members to gauge the financial strain PWCS employees are experiencing and gather anecdotes of real life experiences from employees. The survey was live for a little over a week and we received responses from over 80 work sites and a wide variety of employee groups, including teachers, administrators, bookkeepers, custodians, bus drivers, teacher assistants, school counselors, psychologists, T-specs, librarians, library assistants, and more. We asked members if they have considered leaving PWCS because of their current salary and whether they supplement their income. The majority answered yes. We also included an open-ended comment section where they could share whatever they wanted. They were very, there were very clear themes amongst the responses, including employees are supplementing their income by working second or third jobs, employees researching seeking employment in a surrounding school division where they could make more money, teachers are considering leaving the profession altogether because they could make more money and have a lighter workload. Employees that do live in Prince William County can only afford to do so because they have a spouse who earns enough, live with roommates or parents, or they work multiple jobs. School board members, if we want to be a world-class school division, we have to be world-class in everything that we do, including compensating employees. As you go through the budget markup, we urge you to take bold steps to improve employee compensation. Thank you. Jasmine Shapok? Uh, Shapok, I'm sorry. I'll get it right. Shapok. Jasmine Shapok. So first, I want to say um, thank you to people who offered the balance by offering another aspect for Jason Eldridge. It is not the intention of the person who issues words that are gauged by law. It is the impact and the perception of the recipient of the words. So for everyone who was not one of the varsity football players who was told to go back to where they came from and who isn't a student who was told, I'll be happy to sign your paperwork today. More importantly, if you are not a parent of one of the students who was othered. We respect your opinion, but you have no authority to know the impact of how those words made those students and those parents feel. More importantly, 547 voters saw his actual words, many white, many old, many who don't fit the minority demographic, and they were appalled and it offended them. So the impact to them was this is inappropriate and it is harassing because he has authority. So what I came to say is thank you for coming. We, we appreciate your sentiment, but the same way that Coach Gary Wortham Jr. said words to an adult and he is black and that adult was white, it did not matter his intention of what he meant in their disagreement. He was disciplined based on the way that that adult perceived in the impact of his words. And what we are asking is for the approximate 40 plus players, minorities, and for as parents, the way that we watched our sons break 
and cry and feel enraged as someone had authority over them. We are asking for you to care and excuse my French, give a damn about the way it made them feel. More importantly, he violated Regulation 738-1, which says that no student will be discriminated against based on a protected category of race. And when that harassment occurs, an internal investigation will occur within 10 days. We made note of this. This is Prince William County School Board's Regulation 738-1. An internal investigation did not happen. It did not happen within 10 days. It is now March 4th. We have an external investigation and no student, no player who this supposed investigation is for, not one of the parents, not one of those players has been contacted by people who have post eight years high school education. Thank you. Natasha Gillespie. Hi, my name is Natasha Gillespie and my address is on file. Um, it's funny how when someone doesn't agree with you, consider your situation negative. I've sat and I listened to all the kind words and positive experience others have had with Mr. Eldridge. The fact that I never had the opportunity to experience anything positive from Mr. Eldridge is very disheartening. It took several board me me meetings for Mr. Eldridge to find people to defend his honor. Meanwhile, what is not defendable, defendable it is, is his many acts and non-compliance with FERPA regulation. As they apply to students and his many in inappropriate comments made in front of parents unrelated to the students he spoke about. While I may appreciate his peers attempt to salvage his reputation, I'm sorry, but the damage has already been done. And the, facts, and the fact that I presented in previous board meetings and to Ms. Abney, I leave, I leave you all with one question to ponder. Why did, why did Jason treat, treat Coach Wortham and his staff differently than the people who spoke tonight? Thank you. Kimberly Campbell. My name is Kimberly Campbell. My address is on file. I had a whole speech prepared for you guys, but um, based on what I've heard, I, I think I'm gonna change it around a little bit. My son, Kyrie, graduated from Woodbridge in 2016. He's one of Coach Gary Wortham's football, prior football players. Full scholarship to the University of Florida, thanks to the assistance of Gary Wortham and his coaching staff. My daughter is currently a sophomore at Woodbridge Senior High School. I'm thankful for Mrs. Wiggins, Mrs. Gillespie, and the others that have spoken up for our children. <clears throat> I take issue with the actions of Jason Eldridge, but I am seriously disgusted by the direction central office has forced on Heather Abney and Jason Eldridge by their own admission. I actually have that text message. I am even more disgusted that Heather, as the first female minority principal at Woodbridge Senior High School, is not taking up for our tan, black, and brown children. In my opinion, nothing anyone says here tonight to support Jason or Heather takes away from the negative impact they have had on our children. I hope that through these investigations, the leadership, and when I say leadership, I'm calling out Heather Abney, Jason Eldridge, Michael Mulgrew, and Steve Waltz are found incompetent of leading our children and are removed from their positions. I look forward to revealing more to you in the upcoming meetings. Thank you. Okay, that concludes citizen comment time. We will move on to 1701, which is the equity scorecard presentation. Um, Mr. Iman. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you. Good evening, Chairman Latif, Vice Chairman Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Waltz. We're pleased to provide you and the community with our presentation of the Prince William County Public Schools Equity Scorecard. 
While the board has, been a has seen a working draft of the scorecard in the past, tonight is our formal unveiling, which is particularly relevant during Equity Education Month and the board's approval of our resolution as part of tonight's consent agenda. It is important that you keep in mind that tonight's presentation is designed to share equity data in a variety of areas, as well as to highlight how the data can be uh, provided. I ask that you please hold any clarification questions about how the data is displayed in the equity scorecard until the end of the presentation. And to understand that we are not entertaining questions tonight on the interventions and initiatives regarding the data itself. The board and community will also learn of various ways board members and the public can access school division and school level data. And now it's my distinct honor to turn the podium over to Dr. Jennifer Casada and our equity scorecard. Jennifer. Good evening, Dr. Latif, um, Vice Chairman Williams, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. You all should be ready to get your nerd on now. Okay, I'm excited. I'm excited to have the opportunity tonight to share with you a presentation of data examined through an equity lens. This is just the beginning of a potential equity scorecard. Tonight's presentation examines data primarily at the division level, but also includes some comparisons of groups of schools. As I will discuss at the end, my office is also working on some web-based visualizations of these data as well as additional school comparisons. There are many slides in this presentation, so be prepared. The reason for that is to only include one graph per slide, in most cases so that board members and the public can more easily see the data being presented. Board members also are get receiving hard copies of the slides and the full presentation is available in board docs for the public. My role tonight is to present the data that my office has compiled and analyzed. At the end, I will point you and the public to additional sites where data can be found at the school and district level. All right, here we go. Okay, this presentation is going to include data in a variety of areas. Data are disaggregated by race, ethnicity, economic status, disability status, English learner status, and sometimes gender. Toward the end of the presentation, we're going to examine data around teachers, computers, and trailers at Title I and non-Title I schools. And finally, I'm going to share, you, um, share with you some ways uh, to access data. Here we go. First, we're going to do some demographic information to provide you with um, background and context. This is the one slide I promised with multiple charts. Um, the chart on the left shows student enrollment for the past three years, broken down by race ethnicity. The outermost ring contains the percentages for the current year, showing 35% of the students as Hispanic, 29% white, 20% black, 9% Asian, and 6% other. That's just grouping for um, numbers sake. On the right side of the slide, you see two additional charts. They show enrollment of our, by English, le er, English learner status and by economic status. You can see that in 1920, 41% of Prince William County students are economically disadvantaged and 26% of our students are English learners. The next few slides are going to look at um, staff. This slide shows the breakdown of staff in terms of minority and non-minority the, for the past three years. Three comparisons are shown from left to right. On the left, the comparison is for administrators, where 29% were minority and 71% non-minority. The middle comparison shows instructional personnel. This year, 25% minority and 75% non-minority. And the final comparison is for all employees together. And this year, 36% uh, of all employees are minorities and 64% non-minority. The last background slide um, compares student and staff diversity for the past three years. For 1920, you can see that 36% of staff and 71% of students are minority. They're presented side by side, staff and student, for the past three years. That just gives you some background because in the next groups of slides, we're going to be looking at those groups of um, students for the most part. The next section of this presentation shares test performance data. Much of this was shared with many of you, but some of you are new during our strategic plan report in November, but additional information is included here. And data for additional content areas are gonna be made available online, science, social studies, writing. We didn't ignore those, but you can't be here all night long. So just to give you some context for how the gaps that are, we're gonna show um, are presented, um, when we look um, at performance by economic status, we're gonna compare the performance of students who are classified as disadvantaged with those who are not. The same approach is used for English learners compared to native English speakers and students with disabilities compared to students without disabilities, and finally, males and females. 
For comparisons of race ethnicity, the four largest racial and ethnic groups in Prince William County are compared to one another, just all together on the same slide. To save space, multiple comparisons are included on the same charts. I do wanna call your attention to our exciting little yellow outline boxes that will appear on many of the slides. These are just visual representations for you of the gaps between the groups being compared, just so you can see it and not have to do the math. Although the numbers for numbers people are all also on the slides. All right, I'm gonna use the first test, for few test performance slides about reading as examples of what I just explained. This slide compares reading, SOL reading performance of students by race ethnicity for the past three years. From left to right, and this is the same pattern you're gonna see every time we do race ethnicity on a slide, um, clustered bars show the performance of Asian students, then black students, and Hispanic students, and white students. A glance at the bars allows you to see trends over time for each group, as well as the gaps among the group's performance. And to put in context, overall performance in 1819 was a 79% pass rate, and then you can see where the groups fall. Here come the yellow bars. Um, this chart shows reading uh, performance by student group and those comparisons. And this is the first instance of those yellow, bo yellow boxes. The first set of bars shows the performance of um, disadvantaged students, they're in the light blue, compared to non-disadvantaged students for the past three years. And that yellow box at front um, shows you the gap between those numbers. And again, all of the numbers show at the bottom. And again, for the public, these slides are available in full screen size um, on the website. The middle set of bars does the same thing, but comparing English learners, again, in the light blue to native English speakers. You will note there are only two years of data for this comparison. We didn't forget one. Um, that's because the state changed how they included in defined English learners for test performance only. Um, and so we only have two years to do apples to apples comparisons. And then finally, the third set of bars shows the performance of students with disabilities in the light blue to non-disabled students. Um, and the numbers again are all included at the bottom. Those gaps in last year ranged for disadvantaged students from a 20, a 20 point gap, a 46 point gap for English learners and 30 for students with disabilities. The next two slides show the same comparisons as the previous two, but for past advanced rates in reading, so you see they're lower overall. They show past advanced rates for the past three years for again, Asian, black, Hispanic, and white students. Overall, the past advanced rate was 16% across all students. Moving on, this slide shows past advanced rates for identified student and comparison groups. Again, the bars are always gonna be in the same order, so the left set will always be by economic status, the middle always English learner status, and uh, the right by disability status. And you can see the gaps here um, and how they, how they form. Now it's time for mathematics. Um, you can see the overall pass rates by race ethnicity for the past three years. Um, overall, to give you context, the pass rate for the division was 83%, and our range here goes from 76% for Hispanic students up to 92% for Asian students. This next slide shows the performance of identified student in comparison groups. Again, the same order, the light blue um, for the groups of interest and the dark blue for their comparison group. This is a good example for you to see how yellow boxes can allow you to see changes in the gaps over time because you see some movement in these yellow boxes from year to year. Again, the next slide show you pass advance rates broken down by race ethnicity. Again, the overall pass advance rate was 16% with a range from 10% for Hispanic students up to 30% for Asian students. And here's our final SOL performance slide. Again, other content area um, are gonna be made available online. Um, this shows our identified student and comparison groups um, and the gaps in 18-19 were 11 for, in, uh, for disadvantaged compared to non-disadvantaged students, 12% for our um, English learners and five um, for special ed. Okay. Moving on from SOL performance, we're gonna move on to advanced exam performance. The next two slides look at the percent of graduates earning qualifying scores on one or more advanced exams, that being AP, IB, or Cambridge exams. This slide shows the uh, performance by race ethnicity for our same groups for the past three years. To give you context again, 35% of students overall in our range when you look at it by group was 21% up to 58, 21% for our black students up to 58% for our Asian students. Now we have that same thing for our groups, our identified student comparison groups, and you can see, um, again, same clusters, same pattern, and the gaps last year were 22 for our uh, bioeconomic status, 29 for our English learners, and 36 for our students with disabilities. 
The next two slides look at the SAT. These comparisons are only done by race ethnicity to parallel what the college board puts out. The first slide shows participation percentages. So this is showing of our graduating seniors, what percent of students um, took the SAT. And that ranged from 40% of our Hispanic seniors up to 69% of our Asian seniors. And then this next slide shows the performance by race ethnicity. Within each group, there are three sets of bars. What's important to know here is the first set is English reading and writing, abbreviated ERW. Um, the second is math, and the third is the total, which is why it's so much higher. That's just a combination of the two other sets of bars. To give you context, Prince William County's overall total average SAT score was 1105, and our range here is 1014 for our black students up to 1191 for our Asian students. All right, now that everyone's brain is spinning, we're gonna move on to some other data. The next set of slides looks at graduation data, graduation rates, dropout rates, and advanced diplomas. Now, we're gonna do something a little different in the first few slides. We're gonna take a uh, longer term look at the data, comparing across five year increments because to allow you to see different patterns. And you can see that there are different patterns of growth for the for the different groups. All of the groups have grown over time, but the way they've grown and their patterns and when they jump are different. Again, um, you may remember that the overall on-time graduation rate for this year was um, over 92%. This same slide, I'm sorry, this slide shows the same five-year increments for our comparison groups. Again, those yellow boxes represent exactly what they did with test performance, the gap between those groups. Again, always the light blue bars represent the identified groups and the darker blue is the um, comparison. On-time graduation rates do differ from test scores is that they really are a standard-based measure of progress, and there are allowances, it's important to note, for our English learners and students with disabilities to have more time to graduate by law. This next slide shows dropout rates by race ethnicity for the past uh, three years, and we had a range of, um, from 2% for our Asian students up to 13% for our Hispanic students. And finally, um, this slide shows the percent of graduates earning advanced diplomas by race ethnicity over the past three years. Again, same order. Um, and overall, to put in context, um, we had 50% of our, our graduates earning an advanced diploma with a range from 37% for our Hispanic students up to 68% for our Asian students. Okay. The next set of slides looks at gifted and CTE participation by student group as well as identification for special education services. The first two look at gifted participation at the elementary school level, and it shows the percent of students by racial and ethnic group identified for and participating in gifted services in grades four and five. Why grades four and five? That's because our identification for gifted involves division-wide testing in grade two with the Negliere nonverbal test, and in grade three, the cognitive, grade three, I'm sorry, the cognitive abilities test. Um, the range here, you can see 10% of our Hispanic students identified, up to 30% of our Asian students. Um, as a point of comparison, the Education Trust did a study of advanced opportunities and looked at elementary gifted participation. In their study, they found 9% of black students identified for gifted and 18% of Hispanic students, just to give you a benchmark. And then this slide shows that um, gifted participation by identified and comparison student groups. And again, you can see here the size of those yellow comparison boxes. The next two do the exact same thing, but for middle school, and it shows over the past three years. Um, I wanna call your attention to the fact that additional gifted screening is now occurring in grade six for all students, but this just began with students this year, so you'll, you may expect to see some different um, patterns moving forward. And again, here the range is of 11% of our Hispanic students up to 33% of our Asian students. And this slide, of course, shows the gifted participation at middle school by our identified um, and comparison student groups. High school, we looked at things a little bit differently, um, just to show you some of the things that we can do and will present online. The next two show CTE participation. This slide shows the participation of identified and comparison groups out of all high school students. Before we talked about graduates, this is out of grades nine through 12. Um, it's also, and this is participating in a program or a course in a given year. It's important to note that taking a CTE class at some point before graduation has been a part of graduation requirements, um, but it's not that they take it every year. But that explains why you may not be seeing many gaps, because in some cases the yellow box doesn't even appear. Here's our first look at gender. I mentioned that we were gonna be doing that, so this shows CTE participation by gender over the past three years. Again, in this case, male is the light blue bar um, and female the darker blue. 
Our final program participation slides look at identification for special education, and it shows the identification rates by race, ethnicity for the past three years. For context, the overall identification rate was 11%, ranging from 5% for our Asian students to 10% for Hispanic, 11% for white students, and 13% of our black students. And then this shows us the identification for special education by economic status and English learner status over the past three years. It's time only three set, two sets of bars. And this year we do this, we do have three sets of bars for our English learners because we didn't change any definitions for them here. All right. The next set of slides look at exclusionary discipline at the middle and high school level by student group. We've broken it out by middle and high school to show you. Um, and exclusionary discipline includes both in school and out of school suspension, so anytime students are excluded from the classroom. The first three slides look at the percent of students with one or more exclusionary discipline context um, and at middle school. Overall, 5% had 5% of students had one or more exclusionary discipline consequences in 18 and 18, 19 in Prince William County. At middle school, the percentage was 6%. We're not showing elementary because the percentages are super small and we were selecting some things to not show you since you had a, enough of me talking. So the range here was 2% of our Asian students up to 11% of our black students at middle school. The next slide shows you the same information, but for those identified student in comparison groups, you'll see those yellow boxes. The presentation follows the same pattern as before and you can see um, overall the uh, trends going uh, down for all of the groups, but you can see where the gaps remain. I will call your attention to, again, there's no gap um, for English learners in 1819. And finally, here's another look at gender, um, and uh, you will see that there's a gap um, of, in 1819, there was a gap of six percentage points with males having a higher rate of exclusionary discipline than female students. Now the same thing at high school, same, same three slides, but showing you high school data. Um, and at high school, the percent of students overall with one or more exclusionary discipline consequence um, last year was 10%, with a range from 4% for our Asian students up to 15% of our black students. And then you'll see the um, exclusionary uh, discipline by identified student in comparison groups. Again, same order, same everything, and you see the yellow boxes. And finally, the last one of these shows you comparisons by gender for our male and female students and the same, same gap, same size gap last year for male and female in high school as there was um, at middle school. Okay. The rest of the presentation looks at some data beyond student data. And the next set of slides show us some teacher, uh, some teacher information. This first slide shows information that's published on the VDOE website. VDOE publishes data at the school division and state levels. For teacher quality, they show the percent of teachers teaching outside their field, as well as those who are inexperienced, which they define as within their first year of teaching, so brand new teachers. This chart's showing you how Prince William County as a division compares to the state for 1819 for both Title I schools, that's the left set of bars. The first two sets of bars you see are for Title I, leftmost is our division, the next one is the state, and then on the right, you see non-Title I schools. Um, each cluster um, shows you first the percent of out-of-field teachers. That means teachers teaching something other than what they're certified and endorsed for. Inexperience, that's the medium blue. And that dark blue is the percent that are both. So you see that dark blue is super, super small, both for us and for the state. And again, this information comes directly from VDOE. We requested to get information from prior years, but didn't get a response. So hence, one year. The next slide shows you Prince William County data only and includes the percent of teachers with graduate degrees at non-Title I schools in light blue and Title I schools at darker blue. So you can see the difference, um, the difference there. In 1819, at non-Title non I schools, 68% compared to 64% at Title I schools. And then finally, for teacher retention, our teacher slide looks at teacher retention for non-Title I schools in light blue and Title I schools in darker blue. Um, so uh, you can see that there was 84% 80, um, of teachers retained at non-Title I schools in 1819 compared to 81% at our Title I schools. The final group of data slides looks like technology and facilities information for, again, Title I and non-Title I schools in Prince William County. This slide about computers shows us um, non-Title I schools in light blue and Title I schools in darker blue in terms of the number of computers per 100 students. In 1819, on average, Title I schools had 80 computers per 100 students and non-Title I schools had 69 computers per 100 students. Um, as you know from discussions about the budget, the proposed di digital equity plan would move schools to a one-to-one -one computer ratio except at grades three where it'd be three to one, but this just gives you context of where we are now. 
And the final data slide, the final one, shows you the average number of trailers per school in non-Title I in light blue and Title I darker blue schools. You can see that in 1819, Title I schools had an average of 2.65 trailers per school, and non-Title I schools had 1.55 trailers per school. All right, to conclude, I wanna share some ways people can access um, school division and state data just to see and for the real nerds among you to download and play with and do your own uh, visualizing. First, we publish annual school data profiles. This slide provides an example of an elementary profile. Um, this one's actually Occoquan Elementary School. It provides um, information, descriptive information about the school, including characteristics, even like the age of the facility, attendance data, uh, class size, mobility rate, staff characteristics, including demographics and the percent with graduate degrees, stakeholder satisfaction, student demographics, student participation in programs, student achievement, and physical fitness scores. High school profiles include a third page because they have so much more data. It includes graduation information, SAT, and advanced coursework. Schools of Excellence designation are also on these uh, profiles and they get updated annually. VDOE also publishes a great deal of information about schools, divisions in the state as a whole. One place where the information is consolidated is their school quality profiles. They include pages with student achievement, enrollment, absenteeism, discipline data, and more. School performance is shown in comparison to division and state performance, all right when you look at it. And the data, in most cases, can be displayed by student group. In addition, they provide public access to performance and enrollment data through searchable databases. Finally, I wanna point your attention to some great outside sites and we'll have links to these on our website. One is researchforaction.org. They have an educational opportunity dashboard that has information about schools and districts all over the country. Second, the Education Trust did a study about advanced coursework. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, looking at gifted participation, uh, they look at algebra one in middle school and they look at um, advanced coursework in high school. And then finally, if you really wanna get into some high powered uh, nerdy data visualization, Stanford has an educational data archive and a site called edopportunity.org um, with some really powerful data from around the country uh, looking at school performance. Um, all these sites compile data from across the nation. It's really important for me to note to you that the data they publish are often a few years old, and that's because they're collecting things from districts and states, all, um, states typically all over the country, and it takes them a while to analyze them. So it's important to be pay attention if you're pulling data and looking at it that you know what year the data um, that you're looking for. We publish data from the most recent year as soon as we get it. As I've mentioned, our, my office is working on the development of a website that will include the data presented tonight with, along with additional data charts and visualizations. The data is also gonna be shared with the Superintendent's Advisory Council on Equity who can discuss and recommend additional areas of study for the future. Before I finish, I need to be sure to thank the staff in my office for their work compiling the data and developing the charts and visualizations. In particular, I wanna thank Marissa Esguera, who's the one who did all the pretty charts, and Dina Ashley. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share the data tonight. I know it was a lot. <laughs> Thank you. We have a couple questions. Yeah. Ms. Williams. Thank you. I have a lot. So um, I don't need answers tonight, but I'm just going to tick them off because there's quite a few. Um, yeah, I know you appreciate that, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. So the first one, um, page 25, which talks about uh, advanced diplomas. Mm -hmm. What are the number of students enrolled for cat for race? Uh, by ethnicity because that can determine the data that we're looking at, um, how it, it skews the perspective. And I have no idea how many black students sure. are really enrolled yep. in advanced diplomas. And if we're talking about equity, uh, I can, from my own experience as a parent, tell you that the higher the grade levels go, the less and less minority students are in those programs. Um, since we're looking at equity, um, page 28 mm -hmm. uh, talks about, uh, oh, I'm sorry, actually I meant page 29. Okay. Page 29, where, where, where do these children go? Because it, it, in elementary school, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, seems like African-American gifted students. And then uh, I'm not sure where they have, what happens in middle school, where they go. Um, and I'm kind of curious what happened to them. Uh, and then where's the high school data? There's no high school data on gifted. And um, I'm really sensitive to gifted, so I'd like to see some high school data. <laughs> Um, and when I mean that, I also mean numbers of students enrolled. Mm -hmm. um, 33, page 33, um, special education, uh, education identification. I, I'm concerned that there's such a high number of minority students, black and Hispanic, um, who are identified in special education in relation to other groups. 
I know white is kind of right in there. It's like 10, well, Hispanic is the same. But it's just concerning to me. And also, out of this group, what percentage of those students are gifted for gifted times two? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, page 34. What, it, what, what is this comparison group? It's actually not just specific to page 34. Sure, so in, in all of those, um, so back on, uh, there's an early slide where I define what the comparisons are, and we, we use that phrase comparison group so you didn't have like 12 lines on each chart. So for economically disadvantaged, for economic status, it's comparing disadvantaged students to non-disadvantaged students. For the L comparison, it's English learners compared to native speakers. And for students with dis for disability status, it's comparing students with disabilities to students without disabilities. So that's in the identified groups or those targeted groups that we report on. And the other, the comparison is that is what we just label comparison group for uh, convention, just so you didn't have 12,000 things on one slide. No, that makes sense. Could okay. you get um, maybe a note on uh -huh. that or updated slides or something? I sure. I'm going to have to redo Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Like yep. a slide with a note on it. No problem. Um, and then for CTE programming, can we get that breakdown by race as well? Um, just the CTE data, because it's, I think, by, I forgot what page. Ge it's by gender. Can we get it uh -huh. broken Absolutely. Down also by ethnicity or race Yep. Um, as well? And then um, my question is, what, what are the plans to, what are our plans we're, I, I'm sorry, I'm like, this is the, whew, seeing this as a board member is the first time I've actually laid eyes on things that I've personally felt, but now there's data behind it. So I'm really um, curious as to what the plans are, proposed plans to do with this data, um, because it kind of reinforces some of the things that we've heard from the public and actually my, ex some in my experiences. And then um, also, um, well, I'll just leave it at that for right now. Okay, I, I think Mr. Iman said they're not gonna talk about what our plans are now. We can do that the next meeting. Yeah, that's what or, I think. Yeah, figure, yeah, okay, oh great. Yeah. And so just as a reminder, um, just like with a budget, fire off questions, there's a lot of data here. Mm -hmm. Feel free to fire off questions to uh, um, the superintendent, Ms. Casada, um, Keith Iman, Ms. Jesse. Hi. <clears throat> this equity report card, uh, you know, we went to Roanoke, uh, several of us, and they have an equity report card. But they are the first school system to really develop an equity program. And with their equity report card is a quarterly thing, if I'm correct. And there's some intervention in be between. Um, you know, I, it's, I tell you, it's just very frustrating for me because I've been on this board for five or six years. I wrote an article called Data Data Everywhere, Not a Drop to Drink. And what I meant by that is that we just keep sharing data. And tonight, I, I wanna tell you, Jennifer, you, you, know, you know I love the, the work that you do, but these are my questions, and I've got about 30 questions, mm -hmm. and most of the questions are, what are you gonna do about it? You know the old four questions? Uh, are the children learning? How do we know? What are we gonna do about the ones that are not? What are we gonna do about the ones that already know in advance? When I look at the number of students in advanced placement, minority kids, I'm very concerned. When I look at uh, slide 10, ELL, 46% 40 gap, special ed, a 30% gap. Um, when I look at SAT, the data seems to be stagnant. It's not moving the trend data, the trend three years of data, which is constitute a trend. The data is not really moving. And when I look at especially SAT scores, you know, I've always talked about SAT scores. And one of the things that I have a person that uh, gave me some data on SAT scores. So, there are, I just want to share this for the public. There are 39 schools, state of Virginia, where most kids attend. Now, some of them have this uh, test optional, but most of these kids have to do SAT scores to get in. At 1165, which are white students, they can get in 26 of these colleges. 
Asian kids with 1191 can get in 25. African American students at 1014, which is the average, can only get in three historically black universities and they don't qualify to get into Hampton. So my question is, I know you don't want us to ask this question, but where the SMART goes, will we get the same report? We keep getting these reports. I'm just saying to the superintendent, I, <clears throat> I am requesting, I need to know, what are we gonna do to improve this? And when I look at the minority staff diversity, we really need to look at diversity. And I'm gonna be very specific tonight. Third floor is lacking in diversity. And I don't know when we're going to address it, but it's been five years for me, and it's been five years of waiting and asking, what are we gonna do about it? So I hope, I noticed that there are some things where you already have a plan where you guys know what you're gonna do about it. So advanced placement, our kids, minority kids, ELL kids, they're not in those courses. When you look at the COGAT, cognitive abilities test, there's a verbal, nonverbal, and a math. Are we looking at the nonverbal? I used to find that if you looked at that nonverbal, there was a skew and we can get some of this. What is our plan? And since you can't answer the question, I'm just gonna give the questions to you. But what are our plans to improve our student performance and this equity committee? If the equity committee, I understand, is not gonna meet for three or four months, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna have a committee that's not gonna be, to be active or are we just gonna have a committee for the sake of having a committee? I'm just asking this school division to keep its promise of being world class. And am I saying we're not doing a great job? I've worked all over the United States and I'm gonna tell you, I've seen some bad schools and we're not a bad school system. But I do think that we tend to not have the smart goals or plans and we just do all this data sharing. So having said that, you're wonderful. You do great reports, but I want somebody to come up here and give us a plan of action. Thank you. Ms. Wall. Yes, hi, you mentioned, thank you for your presentation. No problem. Um, it was really clear and really great. Um, on the very last, the VDOE, VDOE school quality profiles, you mentioned yeah. three places where we could go if we want to dive into the data. Um, what was the second one? You said action.org. Oh, I said researchforaction.org, the Education Trust, and um, Stanford has edopportunity.org. We can provide all of those. I found some of those pretty recently, okay. and we'll put them on our website also and so that everyone can access them directly. Um, yeah. Thank you. How old are we? Ms. Ralston. How, how old are, are what pieces? I'm sorry. Um, I was looking, staying toward the end of this. Um, this SAT? Everything that was presented with the exception of the demographic information at the beginning is through the 18-19 school year, so last year. Okay. The, the characteristics of our population, we have this year's information, but we don't have new performance data yet, and so everything else was based on 18-19. Oh, okay. and, and prior, but... Mm -hmm. So when will you be able to get the, uh, I guess, 20 out in, in another year or two? So um, next year, once we have all the, most of the performance data happen in the spring and everything about graduates, we don't get all that information until the spring, summer. So when we do like the strategic plan and report in the fall, we'll have the most recent data. And then this is now an add on to that. So we'll um, get it done as quickly as we can. And our plan is to then just update the website annually with the new information. Um, Yep, and the additional information that's not here. Um, just some of the things that were asked about in terms of com other comparisons, um, high school gifted, we have all of that we can, we're gonna put on the website, we just didn't have everything um, tonight. Well, thank you. Ms. Wall, I um, guess. Yes, yeah. I um, seem to remember that the math SOL was changed some a few years back and so was the reading SOL. 
do you remember if that was before these year points, that you'd, these data points of these years, or is some of this data going to be affected by the fact that the test itself has changed? So that's a great question, and so we can note, um, and when we provide you the additional information, we'll provide you the timeline of when the test changed, and that again is gonna happen again. It happens periodically, and it happens on a cycle from the state, so we'll give you the old cycle and the new one. Um, and so the most recent iterations did not have the dramatic changes that the one before did. Um, but what we did find with the math test last year, um, that some of the things made, made, some of the changes made the test more accessible to our students who had tended to not perform as well, which is why you saw some double digit gains like for our English learners and mathematics. I firmly believe that it was because they made the test um, more accessible, they removed some of the things that have been barriers. So we'll give you all that timeline when we respond. Thank you. Ms. Jackson. Um, thank you for, the data. I have a couple questions um, to help me understand sure. the data. Um, for on page eight, it says native English speakers. There's a, the WIDA test. Does that include all non-native speakers, including level six? And is it possible to get data without the level six so I can actually see, you know, the impact of the ERL? That's a great question. And so the the SOL data does not include level six. That's the change that VDOE made. Um, the other data, for the most part, do, and I can explain. We'll do an annotation for you and can show you. And then if there's specifics, you, we can break things out that way also. Hmm? OK, I also have a question on page 45 for the teacher retention. Mm -hmm. What's the definition of retention that you're using? OK, that's a good question also. So um, I can get you this. the. I want to make sure I don't get it wrong, but in this case, um, when we've presented retention data at the division level, it's been within the division, and there's some categories um, in terms of who, who leaves and who stays and retirements and all of that. For this, this comparison, it was leaving an individual school, so the teacher could have stayed in the school division but left um, one of the schools in question. So we can give you, we'll provide a more detailed description of what's included and what's not included in retention. We work with HR on those definitions. Okay, so then, thank you. On page 23, I'm, I'm trying to go fast. You're fine. <laughs> um, there's a, it says 91%. Take your time, Ms. Jackson. This is what we're supposed to be working on. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sorry, did you say slide 23? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I think it was 23. Um, about 91% of students with disabilities compared to those 93. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions on this. Um, one is, what is the definition of on-time graduation? Because for students with disabilities, they can go up to age 21. And my second question is, um, is that 91% of those who graduate? And is it possible I could see what the actual percentage of students with disabilities who actually graduate? Sure. So that the quick answer, and we can provide a more detailed one, but the on-time graduation rate um, is a cohort model. So students who graduate within four years of starting ninth grade, except for our English learners and students with disabilities who, if they stay in school, move to the next cohort. And so because of the arriving, so it's it would be 91% of students with disabilities in that cohort when they finish, um, graduate. But we can provide you um, more detail on that also. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good question. Back to Ms. Williams. Thank you, I was just, um, I forgot to ask my mind earlier, so I was a little still in shock. With the, does the SAT, the fact that the SAT test changed, is that? This is all, these are all the three years of the new SAT. Okay. Good question. And then Title I, does that factor in all Title I schools? It is all Title I like schools. Elementary. It, I know Freedom was designated as a Title I school this year. So Freedom is not included because this is prior years, but um, as a Title I school, but they would be going forward. It is including all of them. We do have the breakout for elementary only because that's our most substantial and we can provide it that way too. Okay, and then just for my uh, board member's sake, if you weren't aware, Education Trust, you can sign up. They send out uh, weekly, sometimes newsletters, because um, I get those. And then um, the National Association for Gifted Children also does a weekly newsletter that has a lot of updated in information and resources as well. Ms. Jeff. Um, in the past, I've been able to ask you to give me reports and I, w I need to know the procedure for if I want to get, for example, a report on Lake Ridge schools or report on Title I schools. I asked for some information on SAT performance on of football players uh, because we're, my daughter happens to be doing a lot of sideline tutoring and these kids are applying for scholarships and only to find that not, they're not eligible. I'm very interested in getting that data. Do I go direct to you or do I need to go through Dr. 
to Ms. Iman is in the go through you. Okay, yes. I'm going to send those requests in. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Wilk, um, I'm going to go to middle school discipline. Yes. Request, I want a breakdown of this by middle school. Okay. Um, I'd like to know also an overlapping of teacher retention rates at each of those schools and transfer rates at those buildings. I'd like to have a breakdown, someone in our there is a government affairs team here of policy changes in Richmond over the last three years pertaining to disciplinary policies. And I'd like to also know the referrals process at each of these buildings over the last three years, please. My, uh, sure, Ms. Williams would like to add high schools to that too. Thank you. Um, so, you know, this is great, it's wonderful. Um, this compares us to statewide data and sort of, you know, just in general, but we don't have a breakdown per school. So for example, if I wanted to know chronic absenteeism at our high schools, I want to know who are the, the ones where we're having problems with. If I want to know the graduation rates for each high school and compare them high school to high school, like mm -hmm. on, on a graph like this, I'd like to see that. Okay. I'd like to see um, the, so chronic absenteeism, dropout rate, uh, graduation rate sort of by high school. Um, and I'd love to see the retention rate by school. I know he brought that up as far as teachers. You know, do we, so, you know, w when we're talking about equity, this is, this is fantastic and this is how we compare to sort of say the state or the region or the country. But we should compare ourselves mm -hmm. within the county, how we're performing amongst each other. I think that will allow us to help share best practices, mm -hmm. look at different things, and, and I, I assume you guys are doing all mm -hmm. that on a daily basis. But, but for the board members to understand how, you know, this data, I, and I know you have, you showed us that you can look up each school on its own, but the problem is I can't compare each school to the other schools. Correct. And, um, and I would like to, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd like to be able to do that. Absolutely. And, and I think that makes a lot more sense as the equity council does their work, mm -hmm as we do our work, um, it, it really makes more sense to look at it school by school, district by district, region by region, um, and look and see, are there schools that are, are doing really better? And so if you, for example, take a look at slide 27. Um, I don't know if this is um, you know, explained, and I know you flew through it, but elementary school gifted program, 2018 African American students nearly doubled in participation. Mm -hmm. I have no idea why that happened. Do you know why that happened? I um, well, let's let her answer. I don't have um, an answer right now as to why it happened, but we can we can provide the information yeah. by school, and the intent is to provide information, uh, more information by school online. Um, as well, so yeah, you're right. You can't. You can go see school by school, but yeah. comparisons. And so the questions you've asked, all that we can do, we can provide this one and do a breakdown for you by school. There's infinite things that can be done. Sure. Um, but the questions are really helpful to guide us on what to provide you next. But but this question on African American students jump into 23 percent for gifted participation. That's the biggest sort of you know, as I look at the slide, something that is so drastically different. Uh, do we have an answer for that? Yeah, Dr. Walsh. Well, we can, we can see what Mrs. Bailey herself has to say, but the board in some of the changes that you made in last year's budget uh, procedure made her exclusively in charge of the gifted program. Additionally, we had a focused concerted effort on training out in the buildings that she personally provided. She literally went out to buildings, trained their staff on how to identify and look for uh, those students. and uh, I'm, I say with a very fair amount of confidence that the person herself, Mrs. Bailey, is in large part responsible for the training and the initiatives that led to that improvement. Well, well, I mean, the science fair is this weekend. We should clone her then. Is there anybody <laughs> who could do that? All right. Um, thank you. I'll go to Ms. Zargapur, Williams, and Wall. So um, we spent a lot of time talking about SATs, AP, advanced, gifted, th all these things. Do we have anything that talks about the return on this investment? For example, kids take their SATs, they get a good score, they go to college, do they complete? 
Do they, how is CTE looking? Does everybody who start a program in CTE, do they stay in that program? Do they continue in that work or do they do something else? Do, you, do we, I, I know that's a harder question to answer, but I'm, I was curious. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, go, I'm sorry, Dr. Waltz. So again, I just wanna remind everyone, tonight's session is seeing what the, what the report does. So those are great questions that we can visit through the strategic planning process and submission of some of those questions, but tonight's focus is really on what you're going to be able to see on the thing and how it operates. Um, and I, I have two things I wanted to piggyback on um, Dr. Latif's question for the breakdown by high schools, if we mm -hmm. could also see, I may have asked this, but just in case it's really important, the number of students by ethnicity enrolled mm -hmm. in advanced placement yep. courses um, by high school yep. um, division-wide, because I think that's contributing to some of the data that we're seeing. Sure. Um, and, uh, well, I'll have a second follow-up to that. And, then, and then also, at a later date, and gifted, um, even before Ms. Bailey, I uh, remember sp specifically when Dr. Mudd held the position that he initially rolled out the retraining at the elementary school level, and I think we're um, also doing middle school, is, is that correct, as well? So I know that made a significant difference because uh, teachers were educated, staff members were educated on what a gifted student was as opposed to what the perception of a gifted student was. Ms. Wall. Uh, so I was just gonna add, um, I was on that committee before, the gifted committee, and another effort is the early talent development program, mm -hmm. where that's, that could be one of the things that, I'm just speculating, but um, the effort to really focus on the K through two, and they started K, mm -hmm. and then they did K one, and I think it's K two this year, finding more kids, and that I think is, uh, may explain that big jump in numbers, but it's a great <coughs> program, and it's, there's mm -hmm. a lot of good, there's a lot of good, there are a lot of good things coming out of it. Mr. Wilk, on page 40, Dr. Casada, I would just be curious uh, with the uh, disability, students with disabilities at the high school level with exclusionary discipline, with those, how many of those students require an alternative learning environment because of their disciplinary action? Okay. Thank you. So, I, you know, I, I will bring up the, the idea of looking at each school, partly because as we look at the budget, we're trying to decide, you know, economic disadvantage funding, you know, gifted funding, special ed funding, and, and the idea that this funding, um, one of the things the board voiced at the last work session was that we want to increase that, but we're interested in knowing how it's spent. Where does it go? How does it have an effect? Um, you know, my thought just, you know, you know, and, and I'd like the board to sort of ponder this and, 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 and you all, all as well, that this equity council is a great idea. We have representatives on there, but meeting once every four months, I don't think is, 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 is um, I, I'd like to see them meet more regularly. I think this is a topic we need to address more regularly and, 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 um, and put more effort into, um, and I think that's important. I don't think you need to wait for the next set of data. We have enough data that we should really start looking at it and, and deciding, you know, what are we going to do about it and, and deciding, you know, where, where we're going. And I know you all work on that daily. I know that's something that's already going on. I mean, don't, don't take, get me wrong, but, but this is something the board has decided, mm -hmm. I think, over, you know, just by voice and by concern, that this is a high priority. And I, I, I'm not sure what more we can do to sort of voice that other than maybe just, you know, have some more votes on, on what more we should do. But in the budget, we've made it a high priority, but we want to tie it to things that um, make sense and know that there's gonna be a return on investment with that. And so I think um, in that regard, I'd like the board members to go through this, you know, study this um, presentation and think about, you know, as we, as we work on this budget, how do we, you know, is money the answer? Ms. Jesse pointed out at one point, you know, money's not always the answer, and I think that's, that's a great point. Uh, but, you know, if, for example, we had an increase in, in African-American students in the gifted program, but that increase didn't expand to the Hispanic students that year. So, so something happened somewhere, and that might be a result of like three or four schools really taking action, and, and 
was that because of money invested in those schools? Was that because of personnel and HR or professional development invested in those schools? Those are the kinds of things that, you know, as, as uh, I hope that you all are, and I know you do on a daily basis, but the Equity Council, it'll give us the information to, I really think, do what we need to do to make some um, improvements. And, uh, and then we'll, um, Ms. Jesse, and then we can move no. on. Okay, um, well, no, we'll, we have some more. Uh, Go ahead. You know, I, I, I know I keep asking the same question, but, you know, when we say we're going to look at our strategic plan, well, the strategic plan doesn't come back until October. So when we, we're, we're data collectors, we're d collecting data, and good things are happening. And I know that uh, when I use the term root cause analysis, uh, Rita Goss is one of her favorite words, her favorite phrase, phrases. We've got to look at data and then, then make changes based on the data and do a root cause. Why was there an improvement? I'd like to also know uh, the discipline referrals for African American boys because that's always been a problem. Uh, that I'd like you also to look at that. And I again want to chime in on education trust. Uh, we had uh, one of the presenters from Education Trust come and present to us where they do an analysis of uh, your all the school divisions and we're still in their their data thing. But when you go to Education Trust, you can get, they have an equity hotline there. You can get information on equity. Uh, you can get professional articles and all kinds of uh, insights into what's going on. Uh, we are a professional learning community. Uh, we've got an expert in the room. I would like to see him give us a presentation on professional learning community, put it on the board agenda. It works. It worked at my school. It worked at his school and at Triangle and every, a lot of these high performing schools, they may not call it professional learning community, but the elements are there. So I'd like to, to just highlight what works because we still have people calling professional learning communities a, a meeting. So I would like to request that we put him on the agenda. He's not only locally, he is nationally renowned. I think that would be a word for Nathaniel uh, for what they've done at Minneville. So I would like for us as a board to become more educated on what works because it's really and I know Nathaniel will agree with me, it's really not all about money. You know, we know what works. The Dr. research Waltz? is out there, so. <laughs> Mr. Wilk. Um, on time graduation, page 23, Dr. Casada, yes. can we get, uh, as a board, the matriculation rate to post-secondary institutions by high school per student? So there's some information we can we will um, we can provide the information that we have and we can provide what the state because once they leave us then we get into state um, state data but we can we we'll can put, put what we've got by school absolutely okay, thank mm -hmm. you uh, can we get also the percentage of students accepted into three or more schools I will look to see what we can get okay yeah. and degree timeline status earned. Just curious, we have these high graduation rates. I just would like to mm -hmm. see what happens after. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Mr. Iman. Yes, just very briefly. Um, the Equity Council does meet tomorrow. I know there was some reference about not meeting for uh, several more months. I just want to be very clear. Our next meeting is tomorrow evening. The and, their, and their last meeting was when? When was their last meeting? It was several months ago, I agree. Um, this is our formulation year, and at a minimum, they'll meet quarterly, but it'll be up to the council to decide how frequently in between, and we'll, we'll be moving forward in that direction. Uh, the other thing I was gonna say is with the abundance of questions and not commenting that they're not worthwhile questions, I hope that the board will give us some flexibility in the time that we're able to gather the related information and reply. Uh, but we'll treat it with as much diligence as the board has received um, on budget questions. We'll do the same, um, but it will take a little bit of time to put uh, this, this amount of data together. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Casada. 
Okay, um, I think next go to back to board docs here. We're at um, superintendent's time, Dr. Waltz. Thank you, good evening. I would first like to congratulate Neil Beach, who has been selected as the principal for the 13th high school, which will open for the 21-22 school year near Jiffy Lube Live. Mr. Beach has successfully led Osborne Park High School as principal since 2010, and we are very excited about his experience and leadership skills that Mr. Beach is bringing to our 13th high school. Earlier tonight, the school board approved a resolution for Equity in Education Month. This resolution supports our efforts to look at everything we do through a lens of equity, including educational settings, supplies, technology, staffing, and school buildings. As I mentioned at our last meeting, the Superintendent's Advisory Council on Equity began meeting this year, and I look forward to hearing their recommendations. As we begin the month of March, which is Social Work Month, I would like to take the opportunity to thank our school social workers for everything they do to further the educational, personal, and social growth of our students by linking them to school-based and community services. Our social workers are very important, and it's for that reason that I have added hiring additional social workers to this upcoming budget. Congratulations to Yukito Doe, or I'm sorry, Yukito Dove, a teacher of students with special needs at Leeselvania Elementary School. The Prince William County Human Rights Commission awarded Ms. Dove with a Human Rights Award for her work in advocating for families with children with special needs. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to 1901. SEAC appointment, uh, motions in order. Ms. Jackson, would you like to read that one for us? So um, I recommend that Prince William County School Board approve the appointment of Beverly Hicks to represent me, Mrs. Adele Jackson of the Brentsville District on the SEAC for a two year term. I'd like to second that. Any discussion? Ms. Jackson. Um, I would like to say that I'm excited to nominate um, Ms. Beverly Hicks um, to represent Brentsville on the Special Education Advisory Committee. She is a special educator, a former special educator, and a parent of Prince William County School students. So I'm excited. Thank you. Um, please vote. Mr. Chairman, I'm waiting for Ms. Ralston. <coughs> she, she's um, a yes? Is that correct, Ms. Ralston? Yes. Okay, great. Um, we will move on to... Vote is eight, yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Excellent. Request for proposal 19.02, so this is a, um, on for action. I will, um, I'll actually make the motion. Uh, I'd like to motion that the Prince William County School Board direct the superintendent to issue a request for proposal for a study to be conducted by, the quali by a qualified consultant for the evaluation, competitive analysis, and assessments of those site-based management practices currently in use in the Prince William County Public Schools as those practices compare to the management systems and practices of other school divisions of comparable size. Further, that this study be funded through the current budget from either, uh, from the, through, the study be funded through the current budget from either year-end funds or reserves. Sorry about that. Um, do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Ms. Jesse. I'm not sure what we're looking for and uh, I guess the question is, do we have any idea what this will cost? And there's already um, research on site-based management. Meta-analysis has been done on that. And we could look 
at that to say what works. I'm not sure the basis for this study. Uh, could you give me a little bit? What, what, we, what, what did you have in mind, Dr. Latif? I, I know you have something in mind. You always do. So no, uh, uh, kind of share with me what yeah. you're looking for because these studies can be very expensive. That's true, and so this would be a request for proposals, so we're not voting on actually spending the money right now. We would, we would end up still having to vote on that, right? So if we went out and put out a request, we would get you know, proposals, and then we would end up voting on it, typically on consent agenda, but we would, we, we, on this we would pull out and take a look. So if it was outrageously expensive, this would be something you know, we would look at and decide. But, but my thought is that you know, as, as I've you know, been on this board now 22, 23 months, and um, you look at other school divisions our size, some, many of them don't do site-based management. And, and as we look at some of the, the, the challenges that we face as a school division, um, the question I have, and, and, and it's not been you know, fully answered, is you know, is this something that um, can be better done in a different management style? Uh, are, we, are we doing the best? And since we're gonna do a, a strategic plan for 2020 to 2025, I think as, as part of that strategic plan, I think it's our responsibility to say, are we doing um, what would be considered best practices? Um, for example, if you take a look at that, that equity report card, and we saw African-American students doubled and gifted, you know, or almost doubled and gifted for that year. You know, so one, one thing I would ask is, okay, so where did that happen? How did that happen? Um, is that something we're instituting all the way across the board? And, and so, for example, Dr. Waltz and Mrs. Bailey went in and, and she may have made some changes. Did certain schools take those changes and run with them? Did certain schools not? Um, is this something that is difficult to implement because of site-based management? I'm not sure the answer to that. And so those are the things I'd like to hear and see. Are there systems and school divisions our size? Because it's a lot of money we're spending on public dollars um, doing differently or better um, with different management systems. I, I would like for um, the board to have access to Dr. Marzano's study on district plans and the difference between site-based and top-down leadership and basically uh, the meta-analysis, which means years and years of research, shows that it works best with a top-down, bottom-up approach. Uh, so. I would maybe, could we at least purchase that book and read that book on site-based management and what works? If you would consider that, I'd appreciate it. Sure, I mean, I, I you know, put that request into the board clerk's office and, and have that sent to everyone or get that data, you know, that the, all the studies, pertinent studies would be useful. Um, okay, any other discussion? Ms. Wall. I have a question. So this is a request for a proposal, but not an actual study, right? So no, so we're not doing the study. So we, we would be requesting an outside consultant to give us a estimate of what it would cost to look at our system and give us an analysis on site-based management. Mm -hmm. Ms. Uh, Williams. Um, in, in this request for proposal, uh, are we asking that the board review the SOW, you know, the scope of work for this proposal, or is it up to the superintendent? Is it gonna be more detailed than what we have here? Um, should the board have input into that since it's coming from the board? Is it maybe yeah. work with the superintendent? Because a request for proposals should have some sort of scope of work that we're asking for the consultants, so. Yeah, I think I'll, you know, I'll, sort of defer this to the, when I, when I wrote this um, resolution, there was some back and forth on how best to do this in a way that you would have an independent lens look at it. And, and so the, the way we wrote it is just because of board policy, the superintendent will, you know, he, normally he puts out requests for proposals, but I think Ms. McGowan can sort of help me with that. I think that under the VPPA, the board could help um, format the request for promote proposal, assisting the procurement department in just developing the criteria that you're looking for. And the scope. And the scope. Dr. Waltz. Any further discussion? Okay, please vote.
The vote is seven yes, one abstention. Jesse, motion passed. Okay, 1903 revision to Employment Contract Division Council. A motion's in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I move the Prince William County School Board approve an amendment to the Division Council's employment agreement to reflect the school board's February 19, 2020 vote to transfer administrative oversight to the office of the office of the clerk to, to a designee of the school board and further that the school board authorize the chairman at large to execute the same on behalf of the school board. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Will. I second. Outstanding. Discussion. Any discussion? Please vote. The vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. 1904, on for action, the motion's in order. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilk. I move that by two thirds majority of the school board, the Prince William County School Board waive a second reading as authorized by policy 102, formulation adoption policies, regulations, and approve the proposed revisions of policy 123, duties of the clerk and deputy clerk and policy 161 office of division council to reflect the transfer of administrative oversight of the office of clerk to the designee of the board. So that was motioned by Wilk, second by Ms. Jesse. Yes. Discussion? Please vote. <coughs> the vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. 1905 Temporary Administrative Oversight uh, Clerk's Office. A motion's in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. Uh, I move that the Prince County School Board approve a temporary administrative oversight to the clerk's office by the school board designee, Lori Williams, until further policies and administrative changes are made and adopted by the board. The temporary designee shall update the board on the clerk's office activities at each board meeting. Second. Second. Ms. Ralston seconds. Any discussion? Ms. Williams. Um, I would just like the rest of the board to know, I, I think I've had a discussion with each of you regarding the administrative oversight of the clerk's office. Um, Ms. Walls and I have undertaken a partnership to look at the uh, policies regarding this and to try to work together um, to see if there's any additional changes or um, structure that should be in place. So if there's comments um, from any of the remaining board members as we undergo this process, we'd love to hear from them. And I personally am really excited to have a partner to work with on um, looking and reviewing these policies and um, how we're going to do this procedurally moving forward. So um, thank you, Ms. Wall. A quick question. Ms. Jesse. Uh, when we look at the oversight of the board, uh, the clerk's office, are you looking at um, rotational or if we're looking at um, one person or more than one individual, is that what, what you're gonna be looking at when you look at the policy element? Ms. Williams. Um, well, it, by definition, it, the position has to be assigned to one person just because there's certain things like approval of time and, and that which only one person can do. But those are um, good discussion points that we'd love to hear um, as we take further to, uh, dive into this. Ms. Wall, I don't know if you have any. I'm not advocating. <laughs> I'm just asking the question because, uh, you know, it says temporary. And so I was just questioning that. But uh, fine, thank you. Please vote. Vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. 1906, revision of policy. There's a lot of them on there. Um, this is on for action. Do I have a motion? This is, we, we covered this last week. Uh, so first we move an action. Oh, Mr. Chair. Ms. Jesse. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the proposed division of policy 681 non-traditional educational programs, policy 743, student discipline, policy 744, short-term suspension of students, 
policy 745, long-term suspension or expulsion of students, and policy 747, Office of Student Management and Alternative Programs. I have a second. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Argaporn. I second. Discussion. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Je uh, Ms. Williams. I had a question with the current with proposed changes. Um, on uh, it looks like policy 743, um, which is student discipline. I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to email the question in, but I had asked previously for the numbers, and so we just got that, and I just really didn't have enough time to look at the numbers and then go back and think about the question. Um, but there's a line in the first paragraph. Um, it's actually a pretty long sentence. Um, it's students whose behavior violates the policies and regulations of Prince William County School Board or the Prince William County Public Schools Code of Behavior or otherwise has a negative impact on the orderly operation of the school or health and well-being of others, divert resources from other students, and therefore compromise the educational mission of Prince William County Schools. Can you provide a little bit more clarity on that? Because I'm a little confused as how there needs to be an or there. Um, I would think that if they, if a student violates the policies and regulations of Prince William County School Board or the code of behavior, that would be enough or the only conditions we need to put on there. I'm concerned that when you add the or that that leaves um, further interpretation and that could be somewhat biased. So could you give me a little bit more on that? Sorry, I know it's late. No, that's all right. Um, in crafting the policy, we looked at the guidelines and the new model guidance that was coming forth from the Virginia Department of Education and took into consideration all the different scenarios. I can't come up with a specific scenario for you, but we do try to write our policies so that they um, encompass any potential situations that we might have for not have foreseen. It's not meant to be restrictive. It's just meant to be inclusive in order us, for us to take action should something outside of the other situation occur. I, so th it's worded in a way that allows us to address concerning situations that are safety risk and, and put our children at risk in buildings. Okay, um, thank you, because that, that just struck me as a little, I was like, I, I didn't understand that. And so I thought most infractions would be covered when the, within the first two categories. E one, would, one would assume our, co our code of behavior is quite comprehensive. We are working at revising that. Um, but I think it's a it's a way for us to address and make sure that we can maintain safety and address any unexpected concerns that would arise. Thank you, and I also appreciate getting the the other um, detailed information as well. My pleasure. Any other questions? Please vote. Vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. Board Matters 1907, we'll start with Ms. Jackson today. Good evening. Over the last two weeks, I was fortunate to meet with more members of the superintendent staff and really appreciated the time that they took to explain all things related to budget, spark, technology, and media. I was also fortunate to visit um, Patriot High School and was giving a tour of their wonderful school. On Monday, I was invited to Haymarket's Read Across America Day, and I read The Giving Tree by Shaw Silverstein. It's one of my favorite books, and it was the first book I read to my sons when they got out of the hospital. I think this book is a great reminder of the importance of being kind. March is Social Worker Appreciation, Women's History, and Equity in Education Month. As I've mentioned before, as a teacher, I've never gone a week without seeking the aid of a school counselor or a social worker. They play a vital role in ensuring all students can access learning. I was also a social worker for three years and it is an incredibly hard job. Thank you to all the social workers who commit to helping our families, staff, and students. As a former social worker and teacher, I understand the importance of having difficult conversation. March's Equity in Education Month is a great reminder of reviewing data, like we did tonight, and listening and responding to all stakeholders. Equity starts in this building. While equity is about making sure that all students have the support they need, um, it's also about ensuring all, everyone's voices are heard. I'm uh, learning now to shift from being a teacher to a school board member, and I find myself asking, how can I ensure that my community knows that I'm listening? How can I apply what I hear into practice? And also, how can I make my former students and children proud? 
I look forward to this month in recognizing social workers participating in difficult conversations and honoring women's history. Ms. Zagapur and myself um, met uh, for pop-up office hours a little over a week ago, and tomorrow, my other neighbor, Gainesville, Ms. Wall and I are holding pop-up office hours, um, so please email us or check social media for details. Also, thank you to all the constituents for their emails over the last few weeks, and I also extend my congratulations to Mr. Beach. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wall. Yes, thank you. Um, so I um, will try to be relatively brief. Um, I was able to attend the Independence Non-Traditional Schools Mid-Year Awards for students and teachers, which was inspiring and powerful and very positive and a great experience. Um, I um, attended the Battlefield High School Principals Advisory Council where we discussed the budget of the school and other budgetary needs and that was a good listening opportunity. Um, I also went to Read Across America at Haymarket Elementary School, which was a, a blast. Hanging out with kindergartners and first graders was just like the highlight of my week. Um, we read some fun books and talked about squirrels and other strange antics of pets and <laughs> backyard animals. Um, and it just helped me remember why I um, wanted to serve on the school board. It's about children. Um, I also went to the first robotics competition at Battlefield High School this last weekend. It was a very fun, successful day, totally crazy day. Um, one of the teams in the winning alliance was Team Supernova 4472 from Woodbridge High School. Congratulations to that team. It was uh, amazing. Their robot is amazing. Um, the school health advisory board uh, that I sit on met on February 28th. We learned about the Family Diabetes Support Project. This, has, this is personal to me. My son has type 1 diabetes. Um, I am excited about this. The two school division's two-fold approach to reach out to newly diagnosed families and to those previously diagnosed, help them with that transition back to school and to also standardize care and continue education for our nurses. Um, well, let's see, I still have a little time, okay. Um, there is a social media bring your own device parent information night scheduled for April 2nd from 7 to 8.30 at Colgan High School. Um, so if for any parents who may still be up and listening, I highly <laughs> encourage you to go to that. Um, congratulations to teachers who have been nominated for Teacher of the Year. Four of those teachers are from Battlefield High School and two of them are teachers that my children currently have, actually, so that was pretty exciting. And one of them is also a teacher that one of my children had. So um, congratulations to all the teachers on that list. And to Neil Beach, who was named the principal of the 13th High School. Many families in my district will be attending the new 13th High School, so I'm excited to see a principal named. I'm excited to see that school take shape and um, be join the ranks of our great high schools in Prince William County. My last um, brief thought will be um, towards the coronavirus. Um, I know it's a serious disease and we should take precautions. We shouldn't panic, but we should think ahead what of the, the different scenarios that may be coming our way um, and listen to the advice of our community health departments and other government officials in the school division and make sure that we're doing the right thing and not panicking or spreading disinformation. Um, and yeah, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Ms. Ralston. <laughs> Mr. Wilk. Ms. Ralston, your brevity is lovely. <laughs> um, in the last couple uh, weeks, it's been busy, obviously, with the budget stuff, taking uh, at least one or two nights a week. Uh, but fortunately, I've been able uh, to do some events and go to some things. Uh, actually, Ms. Williams attended all three of these with me, three Potomac basketball games. Uh, it's a major run right now, outstanding team. Um, and watching uh, wins destroyed Garfield, no surprise, beat For Forest Park, and then also last week beat Massaponics. Well, Forest Park twice, yes, but that wasn't within the two weeks, but that was good. Um, so it was great to see that. Uh, they play Friday night at Hilton, um, and hopefully, again, state qualifying, so it'll be very exciting uh, to continue that. So great, that blue blood. Um, Patty Night of the Arts, that was a great night. I like how they orchestrated it, uh, uh, recognition to uh, the, the principal and the team. Uh, and they uh, did a combined night, started the morning, uh, not the morning, but the early shift, two uh, second graders and the third graders took the later shift, so it got parents in and out, so very well orchestrated. Visited Henderson Elementary uh, with Suzanne Bevins, Principal Bevins, always a nice visit. 
uh, and then also uh, visit, uh, attended the Grand Park Snowball Dance. Well attended, uh, great event. Kids seemed great, they were ha very happy. Everything went well, very good program. Uh, also, Dumfries had a father-daughter dance, another well-attended event. It was great to uh, go from there to Grand Park, then a basketball game, so it was like a triple-header night. Um, and then on Sunday, Ms. Agapur joined me uh, last uh, at Panera for a Citizens, my, um, I don't know if any other board member had a chance this year, but I created a Citizens Budget Committee in the Potomac District. Um, so we had about 10, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's great, I know you have something to say. Um, a citizen budget committee, uh, we met together uh, on Sunday, uh, came up with some great recommendations uh, and uh, moving forward, so I'm very excited about that. So we'll be meeting once more before markup. Ms. Jesse. I want to congratulate uh, Kogan High School basketball. I did not attend the game, but I understand they're gonna be in the quarterfinals, and it will be at Hilton. It, yeah, we're both going. Yeah. Oh, I'll see you there. Oh, every, everybody. So everybody's going to be there. Okay. It's going to be great. Uh, on, uh, first of all, uh, Woodbridge High School, um, I want to talk about the educational part of my job as a board member. Uh, one, I just want to remember how great that school is. And just because there's a problem now doesn't doesn't negate all the good things that have happened. But uh, approximately five years ago, I met Ms. Marion Cohen, who is the Campus Executive Director for Aviation Institute of Maintenance. And I met her through Jerry Conley. She and I were working on a project together. And we I visited for several years trying to get aviation maintenance, not thinking about Woodbridge High School, to be honest with you, because that their facility is in Manassas, Virginia. And on August 5th, she uh, decided, her aviation maintenance decided to give a program to Woodbridge High School after school. Um, it, we got caught in a political situation and it was divided and now there is an after school program, but it's only a, um, it's a club. And I think I have a slide. I sent a slide in. I'm not sure because I don't see the communications director. Is it up? Okay. This is at Woodbridge High School. There are only five students. We had hoped to have a class for 23 students, but Mrs. Cohen is saying that it's, that class is going great. I've asked for um, Mr. Iman. I'd like to visit. I've asked for that visit. I'd like to go ahead and visit over there and see that program. But recently, I received this, and I'm reading it in public, from Ms. Cohen, and she says that AMM would like to provide aviation classes. As you know, we're sharing with Stonewall. Stonewall is gonna get an aviation maintenance program during the day. It's already in the CTA plan. Uh, they would like to provide aviation classes at no cost to Woodbridge High School for the academic terms of 2020 and 2021 and 21 and 21, 22 at no cost. The stipulation, the classes must be done, must be during the regular school hour. Again, this needs to be during school hours and the course should be treated as an elective for students. Afterwards, after those two years of a free program for Woodbridge High School, we would only charge for administrative costs for the program. So I'm asking the superintendent and Mr. Iman and the instructional Ms. Goss to work with me to implement that program at Woodbridge High School. Uh, we need a program there and I've been very patient. I'm still, you know, I'm st all the things that are happening at Woodbridge High School, my job is to make sure Woodbridge High School gets what it needs and I'd like to see that implemented. Thank you. I will be letting Hala Ayala know because she and I have visited and also the Secretary of Education. He's very interested in follow-up, so I will be alerting them of this offer. Thank you. Ms. Argapur. 
Uh, good evening. I had a um, busy couple of weeks. I, I too got to see the um, staff and student awards at the um, Independence Non-Traditional School. Yeah, we were there. It, it was a great uh, event, but the culture was just so, um, it, it was an amazing, um, it, it, the, the culture of the school just, you could tell what a great place it is for students and for staff. Um, I also had a chance to go out and visit Loch Lomond. They had a family night and that was a lot of fun. I believe I got to witness the fastest flosser in the entire county. It's this little kid, he could do it faster than anyone. I, that school also had an amazing culture. The staff, the students, the families, they were all amazing and happy. Um, last night I got to hear the Colgan orchestras do their pre-assessment uh, concert. Um, the, Th this, this school is the school my daughter goes to, but some of her friends play in the orchestra, so it was a really nice chance for me to hear that. Um, it is also music in our school's month, and I, that didn't get it on our agenda, so I'm gonna make sure it gets noticed. As a music teacher, I, I, I really appreciate when we get noticed. Um, we have been going to many concerts. There's been regional or district uh, band and choir and, and all kinds of events, and uh, I hope people realize how hard these kids work. And now we've got these um, assessment things coming up with the middle and high schools. So uh, this weekend is the band. They will be over at Hilton High School, and they, um, you can reach out to band directors and find out when your, your school's gonna play. Um, this is also um, a chance for me to thank Mr. Beach for his service to Osborne Park. My older two daughters had him as a principal, um, and I know OP will miss him. Um, and, and I know we're going to work very hard to find uh, new leadership. But uh, thank you for your service to Osborne Park, Mr. Beach. Um, I also want to make sure that I mention my thank yous to the staff who continue to answer my questions, no matter how many they are. Thank you for putting up with those. Uh, thank you for the board. You all have been amazing to work with, to be able to do office hours with Adele Jackson and um, with um, Lily Jesse has been awesome. And to, have, to be able to work on some budget things with um, Justin Wilk has been um, a, a good a good plan uh, or a good way for me to dip into this. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about real quick is the Virginia School Board Association has decreed that it is equity in education month. And um, as a equity lead in my school, um, this is my other jobs badge and on the back, uh, as an equity lead, I'm in charge of training staff. So one of the things that we did on Tuesday in my school was we did a deep dive on privilege, on power, on bias. And I want to read this because we had a big discussion on, amongst our staff. So we look at our curriculum, we look at our children, we have to make the best decisions we, for everybody involved. So this is the thing I carry on my badge. Sorry, red thing, I'm talking. Uh, diversity asks who's in the room. <laughs> Equity responds who's trying to get in the room but can't and whose presence in that room is under constant threat of erasure. Inclusion asks, have everyone's ideas have been heard? And justice responds, whose ideas won't be taken seriously because they aren't in the majority? Thank you, Ms. Sergeant Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I also was at the Independence Non-Traditional Mid-Year Award Ceremony. Um, I have long been a champion of the school. It is one of my favorite places in the entire county. I just cannot say enough good things. But the, one of the most exciting things, other than the fact that they have a mid-year award ceremony, is they now officially have a chapter of the National Junior Honor Society, and they inducted five students, and it is super fantastic, and I just don't have enough vocabulary words to say how awesome that school is, and um, what an amazing principal uh, Mr. Eichhorn is. Um, and the fantastic job that he has done with the rest of the administration in that building, not only um, for our students, but for the staff there, because after the mid-year award ceremony for the students, he had one for the staff. And when I tell you I have not seen that much support for everyone in the room, I really have not, unless you count me going to the kindergarten award ceremony, where everyone gets cheered equally just for being alive. It was the same kind of feeling, and if we just did that as adults for everyone all the time, we just, I think we'd be in a much better place. It was awesome. Um, also, I want to thank, uh, I also went, attended the Maker Tech Night at Mary G. Porter, which was fantastic and awesome and uh, as well they had all these different booths set up and they looked at uh, it was from a makerspace lens but it 
dealt with technology. So they had everything from Lego robotics to VEX robotics to take your picture in front of a green screen. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting up with Dr. Waltz there and Miss Diana Galata, and we did some really interesting, I think I posted on my Facebook page, I'm not sure because I don't remember, uh, my green screen picture, which was awesome. I love technology like that. Um, they had a black history booth. It was just fantastic, the diversity um, that you saw in one room with technology at all grade levels and how amazing the staff is there at working that into what they do with the students. Uh, next, I also wanted to thank um, Dr. Harris, who came to speak to us tonight um, preemptively about the state's um, pre-K education program and what is going on. We really don't know yet. It's still being worked out, so I just wanted to make sure that she was aware of that. There's no stalling on the division half, but I, I, I am personally interested in learning more about what the private sector has to offer for public schools. I'm a huge advocate for pre-K education, and I'm very excited by all the things coming down at the state level. Next up, we have um, Hilton I Know High School is going to do the CISL program uh, this weekend, so I'm excited to attend there. And then after that, next weekend will be the Parent Summit at Potomac Senior High School. If you have not yet signed up, please go sign up to attend. It is fantastic. It is applicable for parents of rising ninth graders all the way through your senior year. Kindergarten registration is going on. And then my last request is, with all of the new laws um, that are being passed once the General Assembly is up, I was wondering if this year we could do a public update to how those affect our code of behavior and our school board policies. I know the board, the division does a really good job of updating us, but there's some ones that are unique this year that I really think impact our um, direct policies like hair discrimination and things of that nature, so I'm really excited by that as well as lunch programming, so thank you. Excellent, um, and I'll be quick. Congratulations to all our great sports um, uh, athletes uh, throughout the county. There's too many stories to tell, but Colgan girls basketball, Potomac boys basketball, great wrestlers at Woodbridge and, and throughout the county, swimmers everywhere, all the winter sports are wrapping up and we're winning championships and titles and regional championships throughout. So congratulations to all them. This weekend is the science fair here. There will be a public viewing. In the morning, I think that's from 8 to 10, or um, uh, double check the website, but there is the science fair will be held. It's the regional science fair here at the county, and that'll be for middle school and high school. It's a fantastic event. I'd encourage you to come see what our wonderful students are doing. Uh, on that note, I'd like to point out, uh, and I may embarrass her, but Denise Hebner was the principal at Benton Middle School when they brought the science fair there. And, um, you know, I think. Um, within a year, one of the s students won the National Science Fair. Um, and so, you know, we win championships and football championships, and great, that's great, and they, they happen, but um, it's, and that can happen fairly regularly, but it's very rare to win a National Science Fair. You get one winner, you know, per year. So um, that legacy of that program still remains at Benton, where they continue to put out terrific students, and Science Fair is a great program that I would encourage all our schools to, 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 to encourage and expand and, uh, and take advantage of. It's a great opportunity that is, you know, available to all students, right? You don't have to make a team like robotics is limited. We can't get everyone on the team. Our sports teams are limited. You can't make a team, but science fair, everyone can participate. Um, and I'd love to see that uh, continue. And, and there was a good model at Benton and, and because of Denise Hebner, so I thank her for that. Um, I'd like to remind everyone there's a parent, high school parent summit at Potomac High School March 14th. Please attend that. We won't be having another meeting, I don't think, before that. So I'd like to remind everyone. Um, I think we're going to be going back into closed session. Do I adjourn or do we... we okay, so I, we, there's a motion in order to enter closed session. That'll be 2301. Can someone read that motion? Mr. Chairman? Ms. Jess, uh, Ms. Williams. <laughs> I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711, the Prince William County School Board enter closed session for the following reasons. One, to discuss and consult with legal counsel for the school board regarding specific legal matters involving the performance of specific personnel which require the provision of information and legal advice under Virginia Codes 2.2-3711A, 1, and 8. Second. Mr. Chairman, I Ms. second. Ms. Jesse seconds. Any discussion? Please vote. Do we vote on this? We vote on this. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I guess we do. Motion. Yeah. All right. 
So we will be going into closed session for... Vote is eight, yes, unanimous, motion passed. A few minutes, not sure how long. Um, when we come back out, we'll immediately adjourn, and I do not suspect there's any action items that we'll be voting on, but we're going in right now. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? You got it. Ms. Williams. I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.23712, the closed session of Prince William County School Board for the meeting of March 4, 2020, be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters were lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements and were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters were identified in the motion convening the closed the closed meeting were heard and discussed or considered by the school board. A second? I, sec I second. It's Ralston seconds. Um, discussion? Please vote. The vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. Meeting adjourned, thank you.